Nineteen. As Simon was making another pot of tea, purely for something to occupy his mind, Zoe appeared in the corridor from the direction of the flight deck. He had seen her looking happier and knew she was not the bearer of glad tidings. Alliance is tracking us, she informed him. Wash just confirmed it. They're coming out of deep space and their course is straight for us. We're hanging a U-turn and looking for a rock to hide behind, but there aren't any big enough in these parts. Back towards Persephone, Simon's stomach clenched. But they're looking for us there. Zoe smiled grimly. Simon, they're looking for you everywhere, she said. She could have thrown him out the airlock in a spacesuit, and he might have been only slightly more afraid. Dread rendered him speechless. He was paralyzed, rooted to the spot. River will know, he thought. Get to River. His heart was pounding so hard he was afraid it would bruise his ribcage. He tried to swallow, to respond. Zoe narrowed her eyes at him. Simon, she said, you're having an anxiety attack. Take a breath. He finally managed to give his head a little shake. He made a rough cracking sound as he tried to clear his throat. Breathe, she said. They haven't come for us yet. We have time to make you safe, but you have to snap out of it. You can't make us safe, don't lie, Simon thought. But the crew of Serenity had taken him and River in, had protected them before. On their own, they would have already been caught. He finally took a deep breath. Zoe nodded approvingly and took his arm. You all right now? It depends on your definition of all right, he said. Well, you're talking, so that's a start. Go find River. Has Shepherd Book checked in about the captain? He asked. Haven't heard a word. Zoe's words were clipped, the way she sounded when she was very angry or tense. She tapped the bulkhead and said, Stay on alert. We may need to get creative. I have no idea what that means, he said. Keep track of your sister. He went to River's bunk, but she wasn't there, and a paroxysm of fear shot through him. He was hurrying back along the corridor when he ran into Kaylee and Zoe coming the other way. Kaylee's face was pale and her expression grim. It's no good, Zoe said. They've caught up and they're demanding to come aboard. Wash estimates they'll make contact in about 15 minutes. She looked hard at Simon. We need to get you and River off the ship. Creatively, he thought, and he guessed what she was driving at. Right, like before, he said, as a wave of queasiness rolled over him at the mere thought, going outside and attaching to the hull. Can't, Zoe said. We had the hull degaussed at the docks. So go, that's right, Kaylee turned to Simon. See, that means we neutralized the ship's magnetic field. We have to do that now and then to clean Serenity up, like when ships sailed on the ancient sea and they scraped off all the barnacles. So? Simon didn't follow. So there won't be any way for you to cling to the hull, Kaylee explained. The magnets on your suits, boots, and gloves will be useless. Well, you can tether us, or glue us, or we can just hang on, he said. He was new to space flight, so he knew his suggestions might be off base, but the point he was trying to make was that the crew was very good at coming up with alternative solutions. We don't have time for any fancy stuff, Zoe said. You're both going to get in Inara's shuttle and leave, pronto. Wash can lay in a course for you to take so that your readouts will be shielded by Serenity's mass until the Alliance vessel closes in on us for boarding. Simon's lips parted. But I can't even pilot a shuttle. I can, Kaylee said. Sorry, Kaylee, but we need you here, Zoe said brusquely. Inara will go with you, Simon. Now, go wake up your sister. She isn't in her bunk. I was going to look for her. Okay, but be quick about it. Then get to the shuttle. Inara will meet you there. But what if they come after us? Simon said. Try to stay calm, Kaylee urged, putting her hand on his forearm. I know it's hard not to be real scared. I'm not afraid for myself. I'm afraid for River, what they'll do to her. We have to make sure they don't have a chance to, Zoe said. Let's move it. 
Yes, yes, all right. Simon faced Kaylee. She was gazing at him with wide eyes as if she were memorizing him, as if she thought she might never see him again. You're going to be safe, she said, bobbing her head and smiling through what were clearly tears. And we're going to find the captain and, and, she trailed off, struggling. She balled her fists and bit her lower lip, falling into silence. And it's going to be fine, Simon finished for her. Not unless you get in that shuttle now. Simon leaned towards Kaylee with the intention of kissing her goodbye. But Zoe was there, and Kaylee was... He didn't know why his courage failed him. He rushed past her into the dining room. May May? he called softly as if the Alliance could hear him. Where are you? She wasn't there either, or in the galley. Cursing under his breath, Simon hurried back down the hallway, checking the cabins on either side for River as he went. His sister had a habit of disappearing, or losing her tether, at the most inconvenient times. It came on like contrarian clockwork. The voice coming from Jane's cabin gave him a rush of hope. The way Jane was holding court, Simon was sure there was someone else in the room. When he stuck his head through the open doorway, he realized that wasn't the case at all. Jane had been talking to Vera as he cleaned her barrel with a flexible ramrod and a bit of oily rag, in a tender voice telling her what a good and proper girl she was. From his seat on the rumpled bunk, Jane shot Simon a sour look. And he thinks River's crazy. Simon moved on without explaining the problem or attempting to enlist Jane's aid. He had learned the hard way that Jane Cobb needed a lot of explaining to in order to get the big picture, or any picture, even a sketch. And Simon didn't have time to spare for the snail-crawling Socratic dialogue, the circular questions and angry accusations that were the meat and potatoes of Jane's conversational repertoire. He found Zoe and Kaylee in the same spot he'd left them. Both looked surprised to see him. No idea where she's got to, he informed them, somewhat out of breath. I looked in the other cabins on the way back here. She isn't on this deck. She's just gone. Maybe she telepathed that you were going to leave in the shuttle, Kaylee said, her expression dead serious. You know, with her tested certified genius brain. Maybe she's up there now waiting for you. Zoe gave her a disbelieving look. Simon, use the ship's intercom, she said. Tell River to meet you at the shuttle. Hurry her up, but don't scare her too much. You know how to do it. Kaylee, you go check the shuttle to see if she's already there. If she's not, stay there and wait for her. Simon and I will search down in the cargo area. River, this is your brother, Simon said into the intercom microphone. His voice boomed out of the speakers scattered throughout the ship. He tried to sound calm, reasoned, not frantic and about to blow a gasket. If you can hear me, we have a situation right now. Nothing to worry about. Just get to Anara's shuttle. I'll meet you there. We've got to leave Serenity. We're going on a little trip is all. There were a thousand places to hide on the ship. Places that without an infrared scanner something an Alliance boarding party would certainly have on hand, would be difficult and time-consuming to check. River might be anywhere. Ceiling ducts, gear lockers, any number of crawl spaces. She even could have climbed into a spacesuit and slipped out into the black for all they knew. Simon and Zoe headed aft, going through the storage area, bypassing the cargo bay. Their searches of the infirmary and the engine room turned up no trace of her, Simon hated the queasy fear churning in his stomach, the ever-tightening pursing of Zoe's lips as they came up empty everywhere they looked. Zoe, Alliance is nearly here, Wash reported. Why hasn't the shuttle detached? Then Kaylee's voice shrilled through the comm unit. I'm in the shuttle with Inara, and River's still not here. Roger that, Zoe said. Wash? He let forth with a string of epithets. You need the hustle, my friends. Proximity scanners lit up like Christmas, Hanukkah, Diwali, and Kwanzaa all rolled into one. Ship's ident is the IAV Stormfront, longbow class, mid-range patrol cruiser. 
More armament than a porcupine's got quills. Simon blinked. Zoe? The crates. She was playing the flute to the crates before. Maybe she's there again. Zoe about faced and began to run limp in the direction of the cargo bay. She said through her comm link, Inara, are you prepped for launch? Yes, standing by to uncouple, Inara said. We can't leave her here. We can't, Simon pleaded as he scooted around Zoe because he could move faster. Tell me something I don't know, she snapped. Simon's mind was racing ahead, kaleidoscoping with unsettling what-ifs. What if they couldn't find River? What if the Alliance got there first? What if they found her hiding place, but it was too late to escape into the black without being noticed? There was no way a shuttle could outrun an Alliance cruiser or its ferocious armament. If they didn't get off Serenity in time, they would get off her in chains and at gunpoint. And so much for saving his beloved sister. He and Zoe rushed out into the ship's dim, sprawling hold. Zoe hit the ceiling lights and the gray metal deck stretched out below them. The cargo bay seemed close to empty. Even so, there were lots of places to hide in and around the perimeter. There she is, Zoe said, pointing. Simon didn't see her at first. He scanned each crate in turn. Where? Where? Zoe pointed. River had prostrated herself on the lid of one of the crates, her arms spread out, clutching it like a life raft on a storm-tossed sea. Simon could hear her babbling away softly to the contents. Let's go get her, quick. Simon hurried after her, catching up as she crossed the deck. Hush, little high ex, don't say a word. River crooned to the crate's contents, her voice breaking with emotion. Papa's gonna stop you and your crazy whirl. River? She looked up at him, wild-eyed and a little tearful, and said, They're coming. Yes, Simon said, so we have to go. She sniffled. If they open the crate, everyone will die. They will, he said. Beside him, Zoe grunted. She nodded. It's all busy. She flicked her fingers, imitating fireworks. What are you talking about, Zoe said. Getting hot, she said getting busy. Zoe and Simon shared a glance. We'll look into it, she said. Die, River moaned. They won't open the crates, Zoe said. River, you and I have to leave now, Simon said. You have to come with me. He took her hand and helped her off the crate. She didn't resist. She seemed drained. Her eyes had lost their luster. We have to explain she repeated. They are dancing, Simon. Faster, faster. She tried to pirouette on one foot, but he stopped her. Zoe will convince them. Simon, get her to the shuttle. I can make the crates listen, River said. Tell them to stay calm. They have terrible tendencies. They must fight them. Zoe swore under her breath and rolled her eyes. She took River under her arm. Simon did the same. They crossed the deck, then took the stairs two at a time, supporting River between them. Zoe was limping hard. Each movement cost her. Not only was she in pain, but she was putting weight on bones and tendons that needed a chance to knit. What are we doing? Simon thought. We're abandoning the crew. He thought about offering to stay behind. If he turned himself in, surely the Alliance wouldn't bother with examining the cargo too closely. But then Wash, Zoe, Jane, and Kaylee would be taken into custody for harboring a fugitive. And if the Alliance found Simon Tam aboard Serenity, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume River had left in one of the two missing shuttles. A shuttle couldn't hope to outrun an Alliance patrol cruiser hot on its trail. No, Simon, no, River said. Zoe said into her comm unit, Inara, we found her and we're coming in hot. Repeat, we're coming in hot. I copy, Zoe. Inara said. As they reached the high gangway, Simon stole a quick glance at his pocket watch to see how much time was left, but in his brain's frazzled state found he couldn't do the math. Can we still make it? He asked Zoe. Shut up and move, she bellowed at him. She bodily lifted River into her arms and raced for the shuttle. Gone was her limp. She was operating on pure adrenaline. 
Simon puffed to keep up with her, seeing stars when he didn't round a corner as sharply as she, and he slammed into the bulkhead. Someone grabbed onto his shirt and dragged him along. It was Jane. Tourists, Jane groused. The large man easily kept pace with Zoe. Footfalls clanged as Zoe shouted, go, 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 and ran ahead. She disappeared inside the shuttle and came back out, circling around Jane, who was on his way in. Before Simon knew what was happening, Jane flung him into the shuttle and the door slammed shut. The engine roared and the shuttle detached. The beautiful silk brocade curtain that was usually drawn closed to conceal the navigation section from Anara's place of business was open and River was hunched in the seat beside Anara's, who was guiding the shuttle out of its resting place on Serenity's flank. River was muttering to herself. Simon staggered toward her, expecting her to be whispering about the hands of Blue. Don't blow, don't blow, she was chanting. River, bow bay, Inara said. Please, keep quiet. Where are we going? Simon whispered. We're staying out of range by remaining in the same spatial plane as Serenity, Inara said. We're on the side opposite their approach, so we're out of their line of sight, shielding ourselves with the ship. We can't maintain the position for long, but hopefully it'll be long enough. Seeing that he wasn't following, she said, Essentially, we're hiding behind Serenity. Wash is pinging me the latitude and longitude of the cruiser. Each time it moves, I'll correct my course to match it. He nodded. River's very worried about the crates. I'm sure she's not alone in that, Inara said. She added gently, Perhaps River would be more comfortable in my private quarters. Simon took the hint. Clasping River's hands, he eased her out of the chair and guided her to Anara's couch. He put his arms around her and rocked her. Kaboom, she whispered. 20. No sooner were Simon and River inside the shuttle than Zoe sealed and locked the hatch. Inara wasn't kidding about being ready to launch. Once the red light beside the hatch winked on, indicating a closed airlock, the shuttle uncoupled from Serenity's power and sensory connections. Good riddance, Jane grumbled. Zoe, Jane, and Kaylee watched through the door's porthole as the shuttle undocked and the released umbilicals retracted. When the shuttle had drifted clear of the docking bay, its thrusters roared and flared. The blinding pulse of light grew rapidly smaller and fainter until it winked out and vanished into the black. Jane expelled air from his cheeks. Do you think they'll be all right? Sure do, Kaylee sounded forlorn. Zoe knew Inara had shut down all the shuttle systems, including life support. They'd be breathing canned air for a little while, but it wasn't for long, so it should be okay. They'd be coasting through null grav at high speed, putting distance between themselves and the cruiser. With no electromagnetic signature, nothing to draw the attention of the Alliance sensors, the shuttle would look like a small asteroid or a hunk of drifting space junk. Zoe doubted Simon and River had even had time to buckle in before Inara lit them up. Now all they could do was hunker down and wait, hoping the initial blast had gone unnoticed. Where was River hiding? Kaylee asked. She wasn't really hiding, Zoe said. She was down in the cargo bay in plain sight, talking to one of Badger's crates. She was really worried about them. I'm too, Jane said. Worried we ain't never gonna get paid for all the trouble we're going through. Engineer and first mate shared a look. Maybe I better check the cargo? No point in taking any chances, Kaylee ventured. Yeah, maybe you better, Zoe said with a sigh of resignation. Everyone needs to stay calm. Alliance will be here soon. Jane grumbled something about feds and sticky fingers and that he was going to go back to his quarters to hide all his weapons. Zoe let him go. Kaylee headed for the cargo bay and Zoe hurried to the flight deck. Her husband was hunched forward in the pilot's chair, his fingers flitting over the controls, eyes darting from viewing port array to console readouts and back. He was way in the zone. How far off is Stormfront? She asked Wash as she stepped up behind him. 300 clicks out and decelerating, he said over his shoulder. Maybe an hour until they slide up alongside us. 
If Anara plays her cards right, if she can stay dark for a bit longer, she'll be okay. You know, the Alliance's line of sight blind spot gets bigger and bigger the nearer they come. Yeah, she knew that. Everybody who wasn't a complete idiot knew that. Wash was being hyper and jangly, and he had good reason. The inbound Alliance cruiser had to have its missiles and cannons locked onto Serenity. The bastards didn't need much of an excuse to cut loose. We played it really close, Zoe said, but they're gone. And it's not over, Wash said. I could have made a break for it when we first saw the cruiser, maybe lost them with some Jingtai astrobatics, but now it's too late. We've got to stay here to run interference for Inara and the Tams. We'd better pray that Badger's paperwork is rock solid. And the feds don't mess with the crates. With all those warning decals all over them? They might think we slapped those decals on just to dissuade them from looking too close, Zoe said. What would Mal do if he were here? Give the Alliance officers a whole load of bluff, bluster, and baloney, but amiably, with a winning smile on his face. Push comes to shove, she thought. That's what I'm going to have to do, too. Her game wasn't nearly as good as Mal's, but as long as it was good enough. 21. The Planet Shadow, Long Ago the day Mal realized he truly loved Ginny was the day he caught her and Toby kissing. He had been away from Seven Pines Pass a while. His mother had sent him off to Daichengxi, the largest city on Shadow, although not quite the major metropolis its name might suggest, to buy engine parts for a beat-up old combine harvester she had bought from a scrapyard and was hoping to sell to Bro Hopkirk on the next-door farm. She and Mal had been restoring the vehicle together for the past few weeks, and Bo Hopkirk's crops were just coming ready and his own combine was on its last legs, so she was expecting he would jump at what she was offering and give her a decent price for it, too. The journey to and from Da Chengxi was 48 hours each way by train, and Mal came home travel-weary and sore to his bones from poorly upholstered bench seats. He hadn't been able to afford a berth in a sleeping car, and had been forced to sleep sitting upright. Still, he had the parts they needed, and he'd haggled long and hard not to pay over the odds for them. He felt pleased with himself and was looking forward to getting reacquainted with the gang. Sure enough, the four amigos arranged a meet-up that evening at the Silver Stirrup Saloon. Toby even told Mal that he had an announcement to make. That ought to have been a clue as to what was coming, but Mal was too exhausted to see it. Mal himself, during the long fitful nights on the train, had been coming to the conclusion that now was the time to make his move with Ginny Adair. He knew how much Toby liked her, and he knew that him horning in on Toby's plans was going to cause ructions and no mistake. It might even mean the end of the four amigos. But Ginny was so goram beautiful, so perfect. Her sense of humor was as dark and acerbic as Mal's own, he felt weirdly elated whenever she smiled his way. He couldn't help himself. He had to let her know what was in his heart. In a cold, calculating corner of his mind, Mal was confident that Ginny would favor him over Toby. Carrot-topped Toby Finn, all earnestness and gawky immaturity, versus Mal Reynolds, the broad-shouldered, chisel-chinned swashbuckler who made girls go weak at the knees and warm in the nethers just looking at him. It was no contest. Ginny, given a choice, wouldn't even think twice. Just to make sure, however, he had bought a gift for her at a pawnbroker's in Da Chengxi. It was a gold locket engraved with an ornate curly-cued J and suspended on a fine gold chain. It cost more than he could reasonably afford, but the moment he laid eyes on it, he'd known he had to buy it. The J was like an omen, something he just couldn't ignore. Mal was taken aback then when he walked into the silver stirrup shortly after nightfall to find Ginny and Toby already there at a table. That in itself wasn't so surprising. What was surprising was that they were engaged in a passionate embrace, lips locked. Mal rocked back on his heels as though swamped by an ocean wave. His head reeled. A herd of elephants could have thundered by and he wouldn't have noticed. Toby and Ginny? Together? An item? How? Why? When? 
What? Recovering some of his composure, he sashayed over to them. Howdy, y'all, he said, touching a forefinger to forehead like some sort of cowpoke. Mal, they both cried as one. Ginny leapt to her feet to hug him. Toby shook his hand, wringing it with all the strength in his body. Hey, 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 Mal said. I've only been away four days. Ain't like I'm returning from a visit to the core or nothing. My round, said Toby, scampering over to the bar. Mal sat down. No Jamie? On his way, said Ginny. He said he'd be a little late. So how was Da Ching Shi? Ah, uh, you know. Dirty, smelly, full of folks looked like they wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire. Never mind that, though. I see what I thought I just saw. What did you see? Ginny asked coyly. You and Toby being a big old smoochy pair of lovebirds. She looked at him sidelong. He'd tried to hide a note of jealousy in his voice, but hadn't, he thought, done too good a job of it. Wouldn't go so far as to say we're lovebirds exactly, but yeah, we've kind of gotten together. Kinda? Early days yet? How long's this been brewing? A while now. Toby's been more and more attentive, you must have noticed. Can't say as I did but perhaps he just hadn't been concentrating. Perhaps he'd been so wrapped up in his own growing feelings towards Ginny that he'd overlooked the way his rival for her affections was flourishing right under his nose. He's so sweet, Mal. Cute, too. He took me to a shindig over at Sageville the day before yesterday. We danced till sunup. A date? I'd call it that. At the end, as we were leaving, he just up and kissed me. I wasn't expecting it, although I sort of sensed it might be coming, and it was a good kiss. I liked it. And it's just snowballed from there. So this is only two days old, this thing, Mal said, reckoning the relationship was still young enough and tentative enough for him to nip it in the bud if he wanted. But it feels right, Ginny said. Feels like it's been there much longer, bubbling under, only neither of us has realized it. I think Toby realized it, even if you didn't. What's Jamie think, he said. Jamie doesn't know yet. You weren't supposed to know yet either. Toby wanted to tell the both of you tonight. Yeah, he mentioned a big announcement. I guessed he was maybe gonna try and grow a beard or dye his hair blonde. That or something a mite more dramatic like signing up with the independents. Ginny's expression turned sour. Don't say that. Don't even mention the war. Ain't a war yet, Mal pointed out. Right now, it's just the Rim World's making noises about secession and the Union of Allied Planets bragging and bullying and browbeating. Long may it stay that way. But it ain't gonna. Everyone knows that, and those who think otherwise are living in a fool's paradise. Sooner or later, and my money's on sooner, the other planets are going to form an alliance of their own and mobilize. And the Union will surely regard that as provocation, even justification for war. You can feel it coming. It's inevitable. Over in Da Ching Shi, it's all anybody's talking about. There are even recruitment offices popping up. They've got all these slogans. Join the cause before it's too late. A timely militia is a ready militia. Don't get caught napping. The outer planets need you. You can pretend it's not going to happen, but that's not going to prevent it happening. Events have a way of developing faster than you expect. You sound like you've half a mind to join up yourself. Half a mind is about half a mind more than most folks think I have, Mal said. But yes, I'm given the idea headspace, at least. For too long, the core's been exploiting the rest of the verse, strip mining planets like ours for resources, sometimes literally, and leaving us with precious little for ourselves. It's way past time that ended, and if armed opposition's what it takes to make the Union sit up and take notice, so be it. Just then, Toby returned to the table with their beers. Everyone looks very serious, he said. What's up? Nothing, Toby, Ginny said. Nothing you need concern yourself about. To Mal, it sounded like something a parent might say to quell a fretful child's fears. Well, this here's a celebration, Toby said, raising his glass. In case it escaped your attention, Mal, Ginny and I, we're boyfriend and girlfriend now. Ain't that great? Just dandy. Mal said, clinking his glass listlessly against Toby's. I'm happy for you both. Toby might not have marked the stiffness with which he spoke, but Ginny certainly did. Mal's cool with it, she said. I'm sure he is. He's taken a moment to adjust is all. 
When Jamie showed up, he too was taken aback when Toby told him he was now officially dating Jenny. He coped with the shock better than Mal had, though. Of all the guys in this neck of the woods, he said, she could do a lot worse than you, Toby. And given her track record, has. Hey, Jenny slapped him playfully. Some of the losers you stepped out with in the past, sis, Jamie said. A beggar's belief. What was the name of that one? Looked like a pig. Marcus, and he did not look like a pig. If he didn't, how come you knew who I was talking about? And then there was the fellow with the overbite. Chipmunk guy. Not forgetting the one whose nose squeaked when he breathed. Gary? Glenn? Gill? Something with a G, anyway. Greg couldn't help it with the nose thing. Like a Goram penny whistle it was, said Jamie. You don't look like a pig, Toby. You don't have an overbite, and your nostrils don't make a noise, far as I'm aware. That puts you leagues ahead of the rest. Congratulations. Later, Toby and Jenny danced together to the plinking honky-tonk of the player piano while Jamie and Mal hatched plans. Sheriff Bundy made an ass of himself today, as usual, Jamie said. Willard Krieger was saying stuff about the Union, bad-mouthing him. You know how that old coot is, got an ornery streak in him a mile wide. Only reason Krieger moved to Shadow was to escape Union meddling, as he calls it, said Mal. Right, and now he's incensed because that meddling spread as far out as here. He was saying his taxes had gone up threefold. Everyone's taxes have gone up. Hence Mal's mother's combine harvester restoration project. Anything to make a little extra cash on the side. But Krieger's now got to pay extra duties on the goods he imports for his hardware store. He's putting his prices up, of course, but he ain't best pleased, and neither are his customers. Anyways, he decided to go out into the town square and tub-thump for a spell. He stood on an actual soapbox and harangued passers-by. Got himself a fair-sized audience, in fact. Then Bundy wanders along and arrests him on the spot. What for? Man has a right to free speech? Not if it's what Bundy considers seditious talk. There's a law against that? If there ain't, it doesn't bother Bundy none. So Krieger's in jail now. He is. And you know what, Mal? The four amigos are gonna bust him out. Mal was in such a cranky, belligerent frame of mind just then that Jamie's proposal didn't sound at all wrong-headed to him. It sounded instead like a very fine suggestion indeed, not least because it would peeve Sheriff Bundy, and Mal was still smarting from the way the lawman had backhanded him at the Hendrickson place a few months back. Jamie soon roped Ginny in on the jailbreak scheme, and naturally, where Ginny went, Toby was sure to follow. If Ginny's up for it, he said, I don't need asking twice. Jamie's plan involved a small amount of plastique, some detonation cord, a wheeled motor vehicle, a tow rope, and a whole heaping of chutzpah. The barred windows of the cells in the town lockup were in back of the building. Jamie affixed a pencil-thick length of the putty-like explosive around the outside of the window frame, inserted the debt cord, and attached one end of the tow rope to the bars and the other to the rear fender of a quad bike. It all happened in an instant. Jamie lit the fuse, the plastique blue loosening the brickwork around the window. Ginny gunned the quad bike's motor and torqued the throttle. The quad bike leaped away, hauling on the tow rope and dragging the window bar assembly loose. Before the dust even began to settle, Toby sprang into the hole, set to tell Willard Krieger he was free and should scramble out while he could. Only problem was, they had got the wrong cell. Toby's face said it all. Krieger ain't here. No one's here. Cell's empty. In that moment of frantic incredulity as it dawned on the four amigos that all their efforts had been for naught, a familiar voice yelled at them. Hold it right there. Sheriff Bundy came huffing around the angle of the building with his deputy, Orville Crump, close on his heels. Where Bundy was fat and aggressive, Crump was lanky and sly. They were the proverbial chalk and cheese, yet somehow they got along together and made a good team. Both had their government-issue sidearms out and leveled at the miscreants. Oh, you've gone too far this time, my friends, Bundy said. You've really screwed the pooch. Destruction of public property? Attempting to aid and abet the escape of a felon? Unauthorized use of explosive materials? You are going down. They didn't, in the event, go down. 
Marla Finn, Toby's lawyer mother, managed to get them off on a technicality. She and her husband, however, were furious with their boy and forbade him ever seeing the others again. Mal and Jamie, at least. They made an exception for Jenny after Toby pleaded with them. He spoke about her so enthusiastically with such evident ardor that they couldn't bring themselves to keep her from him. They were, frankly, just glad that Toby had got himself a girl. They'd begun to worry he might never find love, and Jenny was, all said and done, something of a catch. It was, in effect, the end of the Four Amigos, although as far as Mel was concerned, the end had already come. The moment he walked into the silver stirrup and the castle of hope he had been building for himself came crashing down around his ears. He consigned the gold locket with the fancy J on it to the back of a drawer and forgot about it. For a time, at least. Seeing Toby Finn again after so long had brought back these memories of Mal's youth on Shadow. They played in his head like mind movies as he lay in that subterranean cell, cold, trussed up, miserable. They swirled like stirred-up sediment in the riverbed of the past, muddying his thoughts. Toby, Jenny, Jamie, himself, and how it had all ended in disaster and a fireball and a ton of recrimination. Mal was only dimly aware of the clunk of a bolt being drawn back, door hinges creaking open. Footsteps shuffled towards him. He braced himself for another beating. There wasn't much he could do to prevent it, so he was better off just withstanding it, weathering it. Reynolds? Someone whispered. Mal turned his head. He saw a vague silhouette in the semi-darkness of the cell, a man bending over him. Here, the visitor said. Drink this. Mal was being proffered an enamel mug. He struggled up to a sitting position. What's in there? He said. Poison? Piss? Just water. Reckoned you'd be thirsty. You reckoned right. But Mal remained wary. Go on, the visitor urged, casting a look over his shoulder. I ain't got long. Someone's bound to come by. Drink. Mal put his lips to the mug. The visitor tipped it, and he sipped the water. It was stale, brackish, but welcome nonetheless. A glimpse of a busted-to-hell nose confirmed the man's identity. Stu, he said. Stuart Deacons nodded. Thought so. Why are you being nice all of a sudden? A couple of hours ago, you belted me in the gut, then spat at my feet. Yeah, about that. I kinda had to. I figure hitting someone's usually a matter of choice, as is spitting at them. But I had to show willing, Deacon said. Had to show I'm part of the gang. Didn't want anyone to think I wasn't loyal. Well, my aching and belly muscles would certainly seem proof of that, Mal said. And here's a protein block. Deacons unwrapped the food stuff and held it up for Mal to munch on. Barbecue spare ribs flavor. Not Mal's favorite, but still, he did his best not to guzzle the whole thing in one go. He was starving hungry. When had he last eaten? He could barely recall. Meanwhile, Deacon said, Whatever else they're saying about you, Mal, I remember what you did for me on New Casimir. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here today and still sucking air. That earns you some latitude far as I'm concerned. Enough latitude, Mal said around a mouthful of protein block, that you'd untie these ropes and let me go? Nuh-uh, Deacons shook his head regretfully. Can't do that. Can't fault a man for asking. They know I've come to see you. I've asked for some time alone with you. They think I'm working you over. They find out I'd freed you, I'd be dead. That simple. Could always stage a fight. Maybe I freed myself, overpowered you, got away under my own steam. No, Mal, that ain't how this is gonna play out. I'm showing you some compassion, but it has its limits. You're still a traitor in these people's eyes. And mine, too, if what I'm told is true. And what have you been told? Mal said. It's a mystery to me, that's for damn sure. What is this huge betrayal I'm being accused of committing? Been racking my brains and can't think of none. Deacon studied him skeptically. I can't tell if you're being straight or scamming. You can surely be ignorant of your crime. I find that hard to believe. Trust me, if I knew what I'm supposed to be guilty of, I'd be the first to hold my hand up and admit to it. You really don't remember? Too bad. 
I'm sure it'll come back to you. You ain't even gonna jog my memory a little? Why, you'll find out when the time comes to face judgment for it, and it's coming soon. Might be best if you just acclimatize yourself to that reality. Mal could see he wasn't going to get far with Deacons. The man had mercy in his soul, but a finite quantity of it. He felt he owed Mal something, even if it was just the kindness of a little food and water. Gotta go, Deacon said. I was told I could only give you a few licks. I'm gonna refrain from doing that, but if I stay any longer, people are bound to get suspicious. One thing, Mal said. I'm bursting for a pee. Bucket over there. Sure, but my hands are tied behind my back. Kind of makes it difficult for a fella to get the old pecker out, know what I mean? You want me to untie you? I ain't falling for that. You cold cock me for sure. Okay, but I'm gonna piss my pants if I don't do something about it right soon. You want that on your conscience? Deacons was in two minds, Mal could see. Man to man, he pressed. If the roles were reversed, I'd do the same for you. Swear. Tell you what, Deacons said. I'll unbutton your fly, but that's as far as it goes. You'll have to manage the rest by your own some. He fumbled gingerly with the front of Mal's pants, like someone fearful of touching a live wire. Mal then shuffled over to the bucket on his knees. He managed, through some awkward maneuvering and hip gyrating, to liberate the part of him that needed liberating. What followed was a full minute of blessed bladder-draining relief, after which, with a bit more wriggly dancing, he was able to stow everything away again back where it belonged. Thanks, Stu, he said sincerely as Deacons rebuttoned his fly. Don't mention it. Seriously, I mean it. I guess you couldn't see your way to slipping me a knife now? A gun, even? <laughs> no chance. Or you could just, you know, accidentally on purpose leave the door ajar. Not gonna happen. Stu. You do realize this is real bad company you're keeping, don't you? These people, these brown coats in name only, they ain't playing fair. They're crazy. Toby Finn especially. I know Toby from way back when. Yeah, he said as much. Said he used to run with you when he was a kid. Trusted you, loved you like a brother. And that's why you've been top of his list of turncoats for a long while. Backstabbing's all the more painful when it comes from someone you were once close to. Toby used to be a good kid. Don't know what turned him, but it's clear he's picked up some harem scarum notions since then. That face of his? That's the face of a madman. Toby ain't someone I'd pledge my allegiance to, is what I'm saying. Someone as feng lei as that is liable to turn on the people around him at the drop of a hat. I don't reckon any of you's safe while you're around him. If he's calling me a traitor, I imagine he could do the same to anyone. All that it take is him getting some twisted fancy about you into his head, and that's it. You're next for the chop. Deacons appeared to take this on board. So you say. Think about it, at least, Mal said. I mean, come on. You're so scared of these people you'd thump a defenseless man just to keep in with them? What does that say about them? Or you? Deacons did not reply. Instead, with a heavy tread, he left the cell, shutting and locking the door behind him. Alone once more, Mal contemplated his situation. It looked bleak. Trying to turn Stuart Deacons against the rest of the vengeful browncoats had been a long shot. Mal might have planted a few seeds of doubt in the man's mind, but he doubted they would germinate into anything fruitful. His main hope, slender though it was, was the crew of Serenity. Somehow, against all the odds, they would find him. He had to believe that. The only alternative was utter despair. He sank back onto the floor and into reverie again. 22. After a sumptuous dinner of fresh vegetables and real chicken, Book took leave of Mika Wong. He hadn't wanted to stay for the meal. He had wanted to retrieve Elmira at Edema right away, but somehow it would have felt impolite to turn down Wong's hospitality, the more so since Wong had placed so much trust in him. And when might he next have the chance to eat such good, wholesome food? The soul got its sustenance from the Lord, but the body needed nourishment too. Book knew from experience that even a humble bowl of soup could make all the difference to a person. 
He caught a rickshaw back from the town outskirts into Eve's Down proper. As the cart jolted along the neon splashed streets, he fetched out his comm link and called Serenity. Shepard, Wash said. Where are you? Are you all right? Do you have Mal? I'm on Persephone still, he said. I have news. Nothing directly pertinent to Mal himself, but news that's nonetheless encouraging. He filled Wash in on all he had learned from Wong about Elmira and Covington. That's good to hear, Wash said. I can't escape the feeling that we're running short on time, though. Me either. How are things with you? Payload all safe? Yeah, we've been making good headway. At least we were, only now we're being overhauled by an Alliance patrol cruiser, the IAV Stormfront. Not good. Definitely not. If it wasn't for bad luck, we wouldn't have any luck. They're hailing us, and I've been stalling them with the old communications interference trick. You know, whoopsies, can't make out, try and say. That won't hold them for long, and just make them more irate anyway. Are they after certain crew members? Don't know, but we can't assume they're not, so we've taken appropriate action. I'm not going to say too much, just in case Stormfront's listening in. This channel's as secure as I can make it, but you never know. All I'll say is, we've relieved ourselves of excess personnel for now, and we're down to a shipboard complement of just four. Oh, hey, Mrs. Washburn wants a word. Zoe came on the line. Shepard, I caught what you told Wash. What are your plans? Seems like I can't expect you to return to Persephone in order to assist me, not under current circumstances. No, if we were to make a run for it, the patrol cruiser would open up on us for sure, and we'd be just so much floating debris. Do you think you could go it alone? I could, Book said with a trace of hesitancy. I wouldn't like to, though. I have no idea what kind of reception I might receive. I anticipate that Covington would not leave Elmira unguarded or his property undefended. One man could, I suppose, infiltrate the premises fairly successfully, if he had the right skills. But it'd be better if there were more of us, in case of unforeseen problems. What if you had reinforcements? I'm thinking we could kill two birds with one stone here. Tell me more. I'll contact Inara on her shuttle first, bring her up to speed, then patch you through to her and you can take it from there. Wait one. There was calm silence for two or three minutes. Book drummed his fingers agitatedly on the thin vinyl padding of the rickshaw seat. Patience was one of his strong suits, but even so, he had the unavoidable sense that every minute of delay was a minute Mal got further away and less easy to rescue. The fact that an Alliance patrol cruiser was even now bearing down on Serenity was yet another blow to his inner calm. Sometimes life seemed like just one setback after another. Shepherd Book, said Inara. Go ahead, Inara. As you know, I have the Tams on board. Shouldn't we be somewhat more circumspect in this conversation? A companion's shuttle has special multiphase communications and ciphering programs that are impenetrable to practically every known decryption software. It enables me to conduct my business with absolute guaranteed discretion, a boon to my clientele. I didn't know that. I'd be surprised if a man of your calling did, Inara said. Our status is this. We've managed to pull away from Serenity without Stormfront detecting us. I know that because it hasn't rerouted. It's still on an intercept course with Serenity, less than ten minutes away from docking distance. We started out by staying in Serenity's shadow. Then, as chance would have it, we passed an asteroid field. We've diverted towards the edge of the field and are laying low here. The asteroids are providing enough scanner disruption that Stormfront's instruments are unlikely to spot us. It should pass us right by. Serenity's the bigger target anyway. And the bigger prize. They're likely to be focusing on her to the exclusion of all else. What this means is that, assuming our luck holds and we remain undetected, We'll be out of range of Stormfront's scopes in about a half hour. And you could then head down to Persephone. Correct. At full burn, that'd get you here by... Book glanced at his watch, then performed a swift mental calculation. 0600 hours local time. I know we're not the true cavalry, Inara said. I know you'd be better off with Zoe and Jane backing you up. But in a pinch, we'll have to do... 
Book had to admit to himself that he would have preferred it if the former browncoat corporal and the gruff mercenary were joining him on the raid on Covington's house, rather than a companion, a doctor, and whatever River was. A very damaged girl, a human time bomb, an escaped lab rat, all of these and more. Yes, he was looking at having three civilians backing him up when there was every likelihood he would need the two crew members with the most combat experience. On balance, that did not seem like a winning prospect. Instead of Serenity's big guns, he was making do with firecrackers. Book knew, however, that God provided. It might not always seem as though he did. Indeed, to the untrained eye, it sometimes looked as though the Lord's methods were just plain berserk. But in the end, all said and done, he always came through. It was a cornerstone of Book's belief, the rock he had rebuilt his life upon. You three will be more than enough, he told Inara. I'm certain of it. And he was. Almost. 23. The main vid screen flickered. An Alliance logo appeared, and a faceless, nameless baritone voice told Serenity to prepare for immediate docking and boarding of an authorized government inspection crew. Zoe could see Wash was not pleased at the prospect, but when he pushed his comm button to reply, he sounded downright bubbly. Great to see you guys. Sorry about all the trouble with transmissions earlier. And we got circuits so old and cranky on this boat, they keep telling me to get off their lawn and turn my music down. But you're here now, and that's just super. Protecting our way of life. Go Alliance! Serenity shuddered as the larger ship made contact. Once the airlocks had been lined up, the seals were secured. Wash turned to his wife. Okay, Zoe, it's your play. What do you have in mind? Question. How sexy am I? Wash blinked. His eyes darted around apprehensively. Is this a trick? Just answer, scale of one to ten, how sexy am I? Twenty. Easy. Except when you're mad at someone, then it's a fifteen. Mad at me? A twelve. But mostly twenty. She leaned over and kissed him, a full-on smacker that as soon as he had got over his bafflement, he reciprocated. Whoa, he said. What was that all about? A woman doesn't always need a reason to kiss her man. Zoe then undid a couple of buttons on her shirt and opened it out to expose more cleavage than normal. You're going to seduce the feds, Wash said. Not seduce, and not all of them, just the senior officer. Bamboozle him. Throw him off his game if I can. Get him to drop his guard. That's assuming he's male and straight, which, given the Alliance's gender equality policy, is a fair assumption. Don't take this the wrong way, Zoe, but that doesn't really seem in your wheelhouse. In ours, yes, but yours? Don't take this the wrong way? His wife said, stiffening. How am I meant to take it? You're saying Inara is more attractive than I am? No, I am not saying anything of this sort. Don't be mad. It came out wrong. I take it back. Wash's voice rose in pitch until it was virtually a bat squeak. I'm just messing with you. Phew. You're right. I don't have Inara's skills. But never underestimate the power of a hair toss, a pair of big eyes, and showing off a little skin. Zoe pouted her lips and shimmied her shoulders. Worked on you after all, didn't it? Yeah, but I'm easy. Oh, Wash, she stroked his cheek. All men are. As she exited the bridge, he called out after her. Good luck, or uh, not too much good luck. Maybe no luck. I don't know. Just don't do anything I wouldn't do, young lady, and be home by ten. Zoe chuckled. Okay, Dad. Jane joined her on the catwalk, descending into the cargo bay with her. You tidied up Simon and River's bunks like I asked? Zoe said. Clean as a nun's panties, bedding and personal effects all stowed away. You wouldn't know anyone had been there. Good. Kaylee met them at the foot of the stairs. I just checked the crates, she said, talking in low, urgent tones. Something River said got me rattled. Ran a full spectrum diagnostic, temperature, vibration, electromagnetic frequency, radiation, seal integrity. River was right, Lord knows how. Something's changed in those boxes. The contents are heating up. She made a face. Kaboom. What's our solution? Zoe asked briskly. 
Kaylee had a quick answer for that. Maybe we can cool down the cargo to slow down the reaction, make it as cold as we can. Seal off the hold and open the bay, Jane said with a gleam in his eye. Don't get much colder than space. Great idea, Zoe said. Yeah? Jane sounded a little surprised. Zoe could only assume this was because it wasn't often his ideas were classified as great, or even listened to. Yes, but it's going to have to wait. We got company. She hit the switch to operate the cargo bay ramp. It had barely opened before a dozen strong alliance team in full body armor and helmets marched into the cargo bay in lockstep. They fanned out, most with weapons drawn and aimed towards Zoe, Jane, and Kaylee. A few carried compact, ruggedized flight cases. Zoe, Kaylee, and most reluctantly Jane raised their hands in surrender. Do not touch your weapons, the alliance officer at the front of the pack said. We will disarm you ourselves. As the other alliance officers were seeing to that, their leader asked, Who's in charge here? That'd be me. Zoe said. Zoe Washburn, acting captain of this here vessel. And I'm Major Bernard of the IAV Stormfront. He looked all three of them up and down, then said, Is this your entire crew? No, sir, Zoe said. Our pilot is still up in the bridge. Get him or her down here on the double. After Zoe relayed the order to wash over the intercom, Major Bernard flashed his credentials at her so fast she couldn't read them. Not that she needed to. The patrol cruiser parked alongside Serenity was credentials aplenty. By authority of the Union of Allied Planets, Bernard said in a monotone, I'll need access to all crew documentation and bills of lading on cargo presently carried aboard this ship. Also, vessel registration forms and tax licenses. Any attempt to conceal information or cargo will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. Are you carrying any passengers who are not crew? No, sir, Zoe said. This is not a passenger ship. He looked around at the largely bare cargo bay. Did you just offload a consignment, or is this the state of your business? It comes and goes, sir, Zoe replied. Usually goes, she added inwardly. While I'm checking the paperwork, my team will run a routine search of the entire ship. A search for what? Kaylee said, all wide-eyed innocence. Contraband or undocumented individuals, Bernard said. Then his eyes narrowed and he addressed all three of them. This can't be your first rodeo. You know exactly what we do. Don't want anyone touching Vera with their dirty paws, Jane growled under his breath. She don't like it. Vera, said Bernard, there's a fifth person on board? Nope, she's a gun. Got the license for her and everything, before you ask. Major Bernard did a double take. You name your... never mind. All the paperwork you want is stowed in the galley, Zoe said. Then, flicking a lock of her hair behind her ear and lowering her voice suggestively, she said, You'd be most comfortable working in there, Major. You can spread everything out on the dining table. I can even make you some tea if you'd like. The change in her tone and attitude was not lost on Bernard. A small smile broke his blunt, coarse features. That's most accommodating of you, acting Captain Washburn, he said. As he and Zoe made for the dining area, Bernard's subordinates began opening their flight cases and taking out multiple reading scanners, whose infrared setting Zoe knew could pick up the body heat of a fruit fly through ten feet of vanadium steel. Bernard sat himself down at the dining table and Zoe spread out the documents in front of him. Hmm, he said. According to the registration, this ship has two shuttles, but on approach we saw both bays are currently empty. Where are your shuttles, acting Captain Washburn? Please, call me Zoe. Very well. Again, that small smile accompanied by a tiny, avid glint in the eye. Major Bernard was not a handsome man, but he was, it seemed, vain enough to think that a woman like Zoe might be attracted to him. She noted the wedding band on his left hand. She noted, too, that he was making some effort to hide it from her. I'll repeat the question, Zoe. Where are your shuttles? We've had bad luck with shuttles lately, she told him. Had to leave them both on Whitefall. They're awaiting spare parts for necessary refitting. 
Kind of risky going into the black without one, don't you think? Risk is built into the price for our services, she said. Wash appeared in the dining room doorway. His strawberry blonde hair was sticking up every which way like he had just rolled out of bed, but then it always looked like that. I was told someone needed to see me, he said. Went down to the cargo bay, but got sent up here. Major Bernard stared grimly at Wash's eye-searingly colorful Hawaiian shirt and the toy dinosaur poking a toothy head out of his breast pocket. Who might you be? Bernard said. Hoban Washburn, pilot, husband. Then, remembering Zoe's plan, Wash said, but not husband to this lady, no sir. Bernard frowned. But you have the same surname. Brother and sister, Wash said. Zoe shot him a scowl over Bernard's head. Adopted, brother and sister, Wash amended. It's funny, though. People often tell us how much we look alike. They do, said Bernard, peering from Wash to Zoe and back again. Act alike, at any rate. Similar mannerisms, similar gestures. Wash attempted to mimic a typical Zoe-esque posture, cocking a hip and resting his thumbs in his belt. He also widened his eyes in emulation of her naturally large eyes, although whereas on her it looked captivating, on him it looked just plain demented. Like twins, some say. Hoban, said Zoe, deliberately using his given name rather than his nickname, as a sister might. Major Bernard doesn't need to know any of that. Major Bernard is a busy man. Isn't that so, Major? Aubrey, said Bernard. Huh? I call you Zoe? You call me Aubrey. Sure thing, Aubrey. Zoe bit back a laugh. Aubrey? So, Hoban, why don't you just hurry on back to the bridge? She made a waggling wave with her fingers, assuming Aubrey doesn't need to discuss anything with you, that is. I have just one question, Bernard said to Wash. What was your course prior to boarding? Wash told him the truth. He had no choice. It was all down in black and white on the manifest they got from Badger, which Bernard now held. That would be for delivery of five crates of mining chemicals? Bernard scanned over the bill of lading. On Aberdeen? Wash nodded. Very well, said Bernard. That's all I need to know. You're dismissed, Mr. Washburn. Okay, bye for now, uh, sis, Wash said to Zoe. See you later. He sauntered off doing his best impersonation of Zoe's confident take-no-prisoner's gait. Strange fellow, Bernard remarked. Hard to believe the two of you are related. Well, we're not, are we? Zoe said. Not by blood. My parents took him in after his own parents rejected him. I can see why they might have. His parents, I mean. Yours, not so much. Growing up, he was always a doofus. Hasn't changed a great deal, but never mind him, Aubrey. You keep examining that paperwork. I think you'll find it's all in order, but it never hurts to have someone cast an expert eye over it. She braced both arms on the table, leaning close to the Alliance officer, so close that a stray strand of her hair brushed his cheek. Oh, I'm sorry, she said in a not-sorry voice. No problem, Zoe. Bernard gave every appearance of concentrating on the documents, but she could tell his mind wasn't fully on the task. Every once in a while, he darted a quick sideways glance at her, taking in her arm, the curve of her bosom, the profile of her face. Finally, he pronounced himself satisfied. Registration code numbers on the engine manifolds are correct. Documentation all checks out. Guess I'd better have a look at the labels and seals on those crates of chemicals, just to be completely sure. They left the dining room, Zoe leading the way. She was conscious of Bernard's gaze on her backside and walked with a little extra wiggle for his benefit. Her injured leg accentuated the motion. Jane and Kaylee were still where she had left them down in the cargo bay. Wash was there too. Jane looked ill-tempered as always, but was trying to rein in his disgruntlement. Kaylee, by contrast, was an open book. She wrung her hands and gnawed her lower lip. As for Wash, he could put on a poker face when he needed to. HTX-20, Major Bernard said, walking around the crates but giving them a wide berth. Satan's snowflakes, they call it. 
that's some seriously hazardous cargo you've got there. It's what we do, Aubrey, Zoe said. There's a premium on hazardous. Bernard waved his subordinates over. See if you can't shift them out of the way, he said. I want to know what's under them. Zoe and Kaylee traded glances. Kaylee said, Sir, these crates should not be moved. The contents are highly volatile. Bernard wheeled around, one eyebrow raised. If they're that dangerous, then why are they sitting in your hold without proper protection? They didn't used to be so volatile. Move them, Bernard ordered. The Alliance officers tried, but they couldn't lift the crates, and they couldn't slide them across the deck either. They were just too heavy to budge. With every grunting abortive attempt, the four crew members flinched. Bernard turned to Zoe. He pointed at a forklift parked along the wall. Does that thing work? Kaylee made a little involuntary squeak. What do you think's under there? Jane said, clearly on the verge of losing his couth and his cool. How dumb do you think we are? I don't know how dumb you personally are, Bernard said. By the looks of it, pretty dumb. Jane's lips curled back from his teeth. Zoe, on the other hand, Bernard continued, strikes me as an intelligent and discerning woman, which is why I'm asking myself how she could just let these crates sit here if their contents are really so unstable, which in turn leads me to wonder whether they mightn't be hiding something and someone's hoping we won't dare move them. I'll move them, Wash said agreeably. Zoe watched as Wash climbed onto the repaired forklift, started it up, and with a grinding crunch, jammed it in reverse. Showing off his exceptional driving skills, he nearly backed over Bernard's foot. Would have done if Zoe hadn't nudged the Alliance officer out of the path of the rear wheel. Ah, sorry about that, Wash said sheepishly as he squealed the brakes. Accelerator sticks a bit. He surged forward, dropping the fork so low it sent sparks flying off the deck. With a reckless nonchalance, he scraped under and scooped up the nearest crate. Zoe was holding her breath. Jane turned away, a scowl on his face. Kaylee looked plain desperate. Where do you want it? Wash asked as he raised the huge box, teetering to eye level. Anywhere, Bernard said. As Wash reversed away with the crate, Major Bernard seemed disappointed to find no trap door hidden underneath. There was nothing but solid, bolted-down deck plate. Move the others, he told Wash. But it was the same story there. Bernard watched as his men tested the deck plates with their scanner wands, looking for voids that could hold contraband and stowaways. When they were done, they shook their heads. Ship is clean, sir, one of them reported. Then he added hopefully, a bit too clean, maybe? Zoe chortled merrily. Oh, hush, don't you listen to him, Aubrey, she said, resting a hand on Bernard's forearm. How can a ship be too clean? It's ridiculous. Her hand lingered. Major Bernard made no effort to dislodge it. Weighing up the evidence of his own eyes and factoring in the obvious allure he held for Zoe, he came to a decision. He scribbled something on the bottom of the manifest, then stamped it with his official stamp. We appreciate your compliance and courtesy, he said to Zoe. You are good to go. We'll be out of your way shortly. Excellent work, Wash said, beaming at Bernard. Very efficient. Very thorough. A credit to the Alliance. Pleasure to make your acquaintance, Zoe, Bernard said, giving her a particularly snappy salute. Likewise, I'm sure, Aubrey. The boarding team left the crew's weapons piled on the dining table and made a dignified single-file exit. As the ramp closed behind them, Wash sidled over to Zoe. I've got to say, Zoe, seeing that performance of yours just now... I don't know whether I'm turned on or should start filing for divorce. Did Aubrey give you his wave address? You two planning on seeing each other again, or was this a one-time thing? You know I only have eyes for you, husband. I was thinking maybe we could play being brother and sister again sometime, to, you know, spice things up in the bedroom. Don't push it, Buster, Zoe said, giving him a whack on the arm that left him wincing and rubbing the affected area for a minute afterwards. It took ten minutes for IAV Stormfront to undock. By then, Wash was back up in the bridge. 
When Serenity was clear of the cruiser's exhaust, he fired a single pulse of the engines and gentled her away in the opposite direction Inara had flown. We've got to do something about those crates, Kaylee said to Zoe. It can't wait. If they're overheating, there's only one solution I can see. Jane's idea. We strap them down and blow the Atmo. Heart vacuum will bring down their temperature in no time. What if that doesn't work? We jettison them out into space, Zoe said. She hated even thinking it, let alone voicing it. The crew were already so broke, but better broke than incinerated. If we lose our cargo, Jane said, we might as well quit flying. Zoe rounded on him. You care to rephrase that? He shrugged. Choice mightn't be ours anyway. We won't have the coin we need to keep this boat in the sky. She kept glaring at him, but he was only saying what she was thinking. She said, strap down the crates, fast, and keep your mouth shut. This is not our best day, Jane muttered under his breath. Zoe thought of Mal. Wherever he had gotten to, she reckoned he was having an even worse day. 24. Inara had seen larger, grander houses in her time, but Hunter Covington's mansion was impressive nonetheless. It was wedding cake white and sprawled over two stories, with Doric columns rising to the roof all along its front elevation, creating a broad, shaded porch area. Twenty rooms in the main building at least, she thought, along with a barn-like stable block to one side and a wing adjoining the rear, which, to judge by the comparative plainness of its exterior, most likely housed the servants' quarters. The grounds were impressive, too, if for no other reason than the greenness of the neatly trimmed lawns and shrubbery. The surrounding landscape was arid and harshly brown, dotted here and there with vegetation, but more or less desert. To use so much water in such a parched region to irrigate a garden was costly and profligate. It was early, but in the cool of the morning a gardener was already outdoors clipping a hedge. He paused from his labors to watch Inara go past. Not five minutes earlier, her shuttle had put down in front of the property. The gardener had been curious about that, but not as curious as he was to see a woman who was clearly a companion sashaying forth. He touched a finger to the brim of his sun hat. Inara rewarded him with one of her best and brightest smiles. She walked up a short flight of steps to the front door, which opened before she had even got a hand to the bell push. The person on the other side was not some valet or butler, she knew that at a glance. He was a slab-faced bodyguard type with a gun on his hip and an insolent seen-it-all look about him. Who are you? he demanded. Inara Sarah, I'm expected. You sure as hell ain't. Nobody's expected. Her forehead puckered into the slightest of frowns. To whom am I speaking? Who I am ain't none of your business, lady, said the bodyguard. Well, is Mr. Covington home? Mr. Covington ain't home. She looked flustered. There must be some misunderstanding. I have an appointment with him this morning, 8 a.m. sharp. My credentials. She showed him her companion license and registration, etched with the insignia of House Madrasa. The bodyguard had already figured out her occupation for himself and gave the documents only a cursory glance. He's really not in, she said. Off planet on business. You sure you have an appointment? Only Mr. Covington, he don't consort with companions best I know. He has himself alternative outlets for his needs, if you get what I'm saying. Must be there's been some kind of mix-up. Inara was now doing an impersonation of someone very confused and not a little indignant. Mistakes like this simply don't happen. I had a firm engagement with Mr. Covington at this hour. It was made over a month ago, and I've traveled a long way to be here. If he was going to cancel, he ought to have let me know in advance. I've a good mind to report him to the Guild over this. Wasting my time. He'll be fined at the very least, and if I have my way, he'll be blackballed as well. Yeah, well... Sorry about that, said the bodyguard unapologetically. Inara insinuated herself into the doorway so that he could not easily close the door on her. May I make a small request? He didn't say no, so she continued. I've been in my shuttle nearly three days straight. 
The water tanks are running low, and frankly, I could do with freshening up. Is there a bathroom nearby I could use? I promise I won't be more than five minutes. You'd be doing me such a favor. No one was impervious to Anara Sarah's charm when she turned it on full blast. Age, gender, sexual inclination, professional obligation, none of it made any difference. A person's inner barriers simply melted like ice under a blowtorch. The bodyguard could have no more refused her request than he could have forbidden the tide from turning or the sun from setting. I don't know. Please? Whatever last few misgivings he had evaporated. Okay, it's down this way. Follow me. You're too kind. Do you have a name? Walter. Walter, you're too kind. Walter couldn't help himself. A smile of appreciation plucked at the corners of his meaty mouth. Inara entered a huge hallway with a curved sweeping staircase and teak floorboards polished to such a gleam they dazzled the eyes. The downstairs bathroom had gold and marble fittings. Inara ran the faucets a while and made some minor adjustments to her elaborate kabuki-inflected makeup in the mirror. She was stealing herself for what she had to do next. Walter the bodyguard was waiting right outside as she reemerged. I'll be leaving now, she said. Do tell Mr. Covington that I was disappointed to have missed him. I'm still unhappy about the unannounced cancellation, but your courtesy, Walter, has gone a long way to allaying my feelings of offense. Oh, you appear to have something on your neck. A speck of lint, it looks like. May I? Not allowing him to grant permission or even to try to remove the lint himself, Inara reached up and brushed the side of his thick neck. Walter touched the spot where her fingers had just been. A small knot formed between his eyebrows. Feels odd, he said, like my skin's gone numb. A companion's touch has been known to have all sorts of effects, Inara said. Yeah, but this ain't. His eyes swam in their sockets. His body swayed. What the hell'd you just do to me, you witch? He said slurringly. It's a fast-acting skin contact sedative, Walter. An hour from now, you'll wake up with a raging headache and a powerful thirst, but otherwise unharmed. He made to grab for her, but the action was feeble and uncoordinated. His legs were buckling under him. He could barely stay standing. Companions have these little tricks, Inara continued, in case a client gets aggressive or otherwise fails to observe the rules. Now, why don't you just sit down over there? She guided him towards a gilt chair, more comfortable than simply collapsing to the floor. Walter sat heavily, his eyelids drooped, his head sagged. Can never trust a whore. The words trailed off to be replaced by deep snoring. And because you called me that, Inara said to his unconscious form, I have even fewer qualms about doing what I just did. She peeled off the oval-shaped transparent patch on the tip of her index finger. It was an impermeable membrane coated on one side with a dose of the sedative. All of the drug should have transferred itself to Walter, but she was careful nonetheless as she rolled up the membrane and slipped it into a pocket. At that moment, a maid entered the hallway carrying a stack of folded towels. She took one look at Inara and at the slumped, snoozing Walter, and her face fell in astonishment. She seemed on the brink of yelling. Inara hurried towards her, adopting a mask of anxiety. Help me, she said. This man just collapsed. I don't know what's happened. I think he's unwell. The maid was unconvinced. I don't know who you are, lady, or what you're doing here, but we're told to be wary of all strangers, even fancily dressed ones. I imagine so. For what it's worth, I mean you no harm. That said, I can't have you screaming the house down either. She was now only arm's distance from the maid. There was no time for finesse or subtlety. She struck her a blow to the carotid with the edge of her hand like a sideways axe chop. The blow briefly interrupted the blood supply to the maid's brain and stunned her temporarily. Long enough for Inara to deliver a second deftly aimed jab to the vagus nerve in her neck. Instant insensibility ensued. Inara caught the maid as she fell, then dragged her to the doorway through which she had entered. 
In a laundry room, amid shelves piled high with clothes and fresh linen, she laid the maid out on the floor, then went back into the hallway to fetch the towels the woman had dropped. She rolled up one of them and placed it beneath the maid's head. Like Walter, the maid would wake up with a headache, but at least a stiff neck wouldn't be a problem. Compassion was one of a companion's strongest suits, even when it came to visiting violence on others. 25. While Inara infiltrated the mansion itself, Shepard Book was moving stealthily around the perimeter of the grounds. He had no idea where Almira Adedima was being kept on the premises, so his only option was reconnaissance. With Inara busy indoors distracting and neutralizing whatever security personnel Hunter Covington employed, Book crept along keeping low behind the three-bar fence that encircled the property and studying the building from all angles. He reasoned that Covington would have Elmira under lock and key in an upstairs room in order to make it that much harder for her to escape. To that end, he surveilled the house's upper story, looking for a window that was shuttered or barred, or both. The sound of a twig snapping behind him brought him whirling around. His stun gun was in his hand, fully charged and primed. Book almost pulled the trigger to unleash the electrified dart that would deliver a 50,000-volt shock. River? River Tam stood there, swinging her arms from side to side. I thought we told you to stay in the shuttle with Simon. Simon wasn't looking, so I came out, River said, to help you. You're no help to me here, Book said gently, but with a forceful undertone. This is something Inara and I have to do. You're best off keeping out of sight with your brother. I know where she is. What? The woman, Elmira. She's in there. River pointed, straight-armed, towards the stable block. Just as Book was asking himself how River could know this, and be so certain about it, too, Simon came scurrying up. River, he hissed. You shouldn't have run away. I've been looking all over for you. Here I am, she said simply. You found me. Sorry, Shepard. I'll take her back to the shuttle. No harm done, I hope. Wait just a moment, son, Book said. River, are you sure that's where Elmira is? River nodded. Uh-huh. I can see her. She's sad. She's chained up, straw in her hair. She knows she's going to die. Hunter's mad at her. She sold him out, he says. I'm going to fix you, woman. River's voice had suddenly taken on a gravel roughness and a masculine note. See if I don't. When I come back, I'm going to show you what happens to bitches that snitch to the authorities. They get cut, all over, every part of their body, every part. Cut till they bleed to death, but slow, days long slow. And she knows he's going to do it, too. Her voice had reverted to normal. He's not a man to lie about such things. Where precisely in the stable block is she? River, if she was correct about Elmira's location, had just saved Book a considerable amount of time and effort. The stable block would have been the last place he looked. Easier if I show you. Book looked at Simon, then at his sister, then back to Simon. Are you asking my permission? Simon said. Preferably, but even if I don't, River's coming with me. Simon debated inwardly. Then I'm coming too. I already let her out of my sight once. I'm not doing it a second time. Who knows what we could be walking into? Book did not like having two people tagging along with him. One was bad enough. But he respected Simon's decision and his concern for his sister's welfare. All right, just please stay out of the way. Leave the rough stuff to me. Here we go. River was already striding off towards the stable block. Book hurried to catch up, Simon at his heels. Off to see the horsies. They were halfway there when River said to Book, By the way, there's a man just inside the doorway. He hasn't seen us yet. You have ten seconds before he does. Again, Book wondered how the girl could have such knowledge. Those Dr. Frankensteins at the Academy had bestowed talents on her that were preternatural. They were even, although it seemed a mildly blasphemous thought, godlike. But he didn't have time to dwell on it. 
He broke into a sprint, running towards the stable block as fast as his aged limbs would let him. Book was, in fact, in phenomenally good shape for a man of his advanced years, keeping himself that way through a routine of isometric strengthening exercises and abstinence from alcohol and narcotics. Within five seconds, he had covered the thirty yards between him and the stable block door. Two seconds later, he was inside the building and confronting the man stationed on guard duty, who was in the process of rising from the chair he'd been sitting on and raising the rifle that had been lying across his knees. The stun gun crackled in Book's hand. The guard tumbled to the ground, juddering like he was doing some kind of wild horizontal dance routine. His teeth were bared. An eerie, strangulated ululation escaped his throat. A wet patch spread across the crotch of his jeans. There's another one, River said from the doorway. Book wheeled to see a second guard appear from the shadows of one of the loose boxes. He was drawing his pistol. Book hit the switch on the stun gun to detach the wire, linking it to the dart hooked in the first guard's chest. The gun was a two-shot deal, but it required closer range than he currently had. The second guard was a good five yards too far away. Book had no choice but to duck down and charge towards him, hoping he could bridge the gap in time. The guard was cocking his gun, however, and drawing a bead on Book. Book knew with a dreadful certainty that he was going to be too slow. The guard was going to shoot him before he could get him with the stun gun. A horseshoe whirled like a discus over Book's head. It clouded the guard in the face just above one eyebrow with an audible crunch. The man dropped as though he had walked slap bang into an invisible wall. Book glanced around to see River looking very pleased with herself, clapping her hands in glee. Nice shot, he said. I love playing horseshoes, River said. I was always good at it, better than Simon. She picked up another horseshoe from the dust at her feet. It and the one she had thrown must have been just lying around spare. If he gets up again, I'll just hit him again. You do that. Where's Elmira? Who? Oh, her, yes. The girl tapped her lips, pondering. Up there. She gestured towards a hayloft. Straw in her hair. Book shinned up a stepladder that led to the hayloft. The horses were stamping softly and whinnying in their loose boxes below, disturbed by the uncustomary activities of the humans in the stables. If luck was on Book's side or some higher power, the beasts would not become so agitated as to draw the attention of people in the house. As his head rose above the level of the hayloft floor, he peered cautiously around. There might well be a third guard on duty. But there was nobody in the hayloft save for a young woman chained to a support post with a piece of cloth tied tight around her mouth to form a gag. Her clothing was ripped and torn. Her hair was disheveled and, yes, as River had said, there were bits of straw in it, sticking out at all angles like pins from a pincushion. She had bruises and grazes all over, and she looked terrified. As Book appeared, Elmira Adedema began to writhe and scream despite the gag. He put a finger to his lips and smiled reassuringly. I'm not here to hurt you, Elmira, he said. I'm here to help. Her expression was distrustful, but she did calm down somewhat. Mika Wong sent me. Only the slightest distortion of the truth. My friends and I are going to get you out of here. Mention of Wong's name appeared to settle the matter as far as Elmira was concerned. Book undid the gag. Elmira worked her jaw to ease the kinks out. The gag had been on so long it had left red welts. Who are you? She croaked. All in good time, Book said. First order of business, getting these chains off you. The chains were secured with a padlock. Book studied it for a moment, then shrugged. It had the simplest kind of lever and ward mechanism. He could have opened it in 30 seconds with a paper clip or a hair grip, but luckily he could do better than that. From his satchel, he took out a compact leather-bound Bible. Concealed within the binding in a recess beneath a marbled end paper that could be detached was a comprehensive set of lockpicks. He selected one that in his judgment matched this brand of padlock and corresponded to the genuine key in length. He inserted it into the slot, feeling its teeth fit snugly against the actuators. 
He'd gauged right. A single clockwise twist of the wrist and the padlock shackle fell open. A shepherd, said Elmira, who can pick a lock? And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Book said, stowing the lockpick back inside the Bible and the book itself back in his satchel. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16 verse 19. He unwrapped the chains from around her wrist and helped her to her feet. Can you walk? he asked. I think so, said Elmira. Then let's go. Time is of the essence. 26. Outside the stable block, Simon Tam was keeping watch. His specialty was medicine, however, not sentry duty. He didn't see the armed man stealing up on him from around the corner of the stable block. He wasn't even aware of his presence until the man pounced on him from behind, snaking an arm around his throat. The barrel of a gun dug into Simon's temple. Don't move, the man growled. Unless you want your brains spattered all over that there fancy vest of yarn. P please, don't shoot, Simon stammered. Don't give me no excuse to. State your business, quick about it. I'm, I'm a guest of Hunter Collington's, good friend of his. Arrived just this morning. I'm only taking a stroll around, admiring the spread. Hunter who? Your boss, Hunter Collington. The man chuckled gratingly. I have a boss, but his name ain't Collington. You maybe want to try that again? Covington, Simon exclaimed. He could have kicked himself. What a rookie mistake, getting the surname wrong. He just wasn't cut out for this sort of clandestine stuff. Nothing in his upbringing or education had prepared him for a life of skullduggery and violence. Slip of the tongue, I meant Covington. A so-called good friend of Mr. Covington's wouldn't have gotten his name wrong, pal. I don't reckon you know him at all. I reckon you're some kind of spy or something. We're under orders to be on the lookout for intruders, anyone sneaking around looking suspicious. I'd say you fit the bill. Now tell me the truth. You got until the count of three, and then it's brain surgery by bullet. One. Two. Two. River drifted out of the stable block, hands behind her back. Hey, Simon, who's your friend? Simon felt the man holding him stiffen in surprise. Where'd you come from, girl? In there, River said. I was just stroking the horses. They have such soft noses, did you know that? Apart from the bristles and their breath when they snort, it's warm on your hand. I like it. It smells of friendliness. She took a step towards the man and Simon. The gun moved from Simon's head, swiveling towards River. Best you stay where you are, the man said to her. I got plenty of rounds in this thing, and I only need one for the each of you. Simon's breath caught in his throat. With the tiniest twitch of his head, he tried to indicate to River that she should stop moving. Whether she saw the instruction or not, River halted. She twirled one foot, drawing circles in the dust with the toe cap of her boot. The man with the gun looked down at what she was doing. When he looked up again, River had brought both hands out in front of her. The right held a horseshoe. In one blindingly swift action, she flung it at the man. It connected with his gun hand, knocking the weapon out of his grasp. Before he was able to collect his wits, River sprang. Simon stumbled aside as River and the man went crashing to the ground. Straddling her opponent's torso, she rained punches on his face and ribcage in such a rapid flurry that her arms were twin blurs, like the pistons on a locomotive pumping at full speed. The man was utterly unable to defend or deflect. Within seconds, River had rendered him unconscious. Still, she kept up the barrage of blows until Simon laid a hand on her shoulder. River, you've done it. He's out cold. Keep that up and you might kill him. He was going to kill you, she said, and me. Fair's fair, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a candy for a candy, a penny for your thoughts. Still, and all, we don't kill unless we have to. River reflected on this, then smiled brightly. Okay, that's a good rule. I like to think so. She picked herself up and dusted herself off. Oh, hi, Shepard, 
and strawn hair lady. Book had just come out of the stable block, one arm around Elmira Adedema to support her. He cast a glance at the man on the ground. No problems here, I take it? None that couldn't be dealt with, Simon said. Then let's make haste. Covington seems to have an endless supply of thugs, and I've no idea if we've met them all yet. Twenty-seven. Inara saw them from a window. River, Simon, and Book with Elmira hurrying across the front lawn. She herself had been conducting a painstaking search of the first floor rooms, ever keeping an ear out for bodyguards or servants to avoid any further run-ins. It seemed she had been looking in vain. Elmira had been elsewhere. Inara made her way back to the front door and out into the daylight. She greeted the others with a wave, joining them on the driveway that led towards her shuttle. A companion, too? Elmira said. Who are you people? Right now, Book said, you're liberators, and hopefully in a few minutes once we've made good our escape, we're going to be the recipients of some crucial intelligence from you, namely the whereabouts of your bondholder. I can tell you that right now, Elmira said. Hunter isn't on Persephone anymore. He departed last night on his private yacht after doing some business over in Evesdown. Do you know where he's gone? Yes, he was boasting to me about it only yesterday, up there in the hayloft. He'd just been... been using me. Her mouth downturned in a grimace of disgust. You mean abusing, said Inara. Yes, well, same difference. And then he told me he was going away, but when he came back, he'd... Cut you, said River. Cut you till you bled to death, but slow. Days long slow. Yes said Elmira, startled. His exact words. How do you know he said that? Have you been speaking to him? Never mind how we know, said Book. Where is he? He was off to meet up with some associates. Bunch of renegades, I think. One time brown coats, now working some new angle. Hunter's been dealing with them quite some while, providing them with intel and such. It's what Wong wanted me to find out about, why he had me come back and infiltrate Hunter's operation. Vigilantes? Yeah, I guess you could call them that. By now the group had reached the shuttle. Inara looked back towards the house, half expecting to see pursuers emerging. It seemed that the alarm had yet to be raised. River climbed aboard first, followed by Simon. Inara went next, extending a helping hand to Elmira. Book was last, and as soon as they were all safely ensconced in the shuttle, Inara darted over to the controls and started the engine cycling. So he met the vigilantes in Evesdown, and then what? Book said to Elmira, raising his voice above the steadily mounting whine of power coming from the thrusters. Then he was going to follow them to their destination. Seems as though they had plans to take some guy captive in Evesdown, subject him to a trial, and then hang him. They paid Hunter to help them nab the man. That's what they've been doing for quite a while, all across the verse. They track down people they believe betrayed the independent cause in some way or other, run them through a kangaroo court, then execute them. Inara's stomach nodded. Mal. Over her shoulder, she said, Did you just say execute? I'm afraid so, said Elmira. Hunter's gone to watch. They invited him along and he accepted. It doesn't pay to turn down a client's request, not if you want to work with them again in future. Plus, I imagine he's curious to see the end result. In case you hadn't appreciated, he ain't a nice man. Got a cruel streak in him a mile wide. You sound as though you speak from experience, said Simon. She gave him a hard, steady look. I most certainly do. I can show you the scars if you like. I'll say this for Hunter. He's a sadist, but a careful one. Never leaves marks where people will see them. But that still means there are plenty of places where he can leave them. She began unbuttoning her blouse until Simon stopped her. Mumbling an apology, he turned away. Point made, she did the buttons back up. Now, Elmira, said Book, I know you've been through a lot, but I want you to be very clear about this. That man you're talking about, the one the vigilantes are going to kill, is a friend of ours. Oh, my God. I'm so very sorry. It's okay. All I want from you now is where they've taken him. 
wherever Covington is headed, you have to understand how important this is to us. The shuttle rose from the ground with a lurch, pitching forward until its nose was almost scraping the dirt. Inara corrected, too preoccupied to worry if their ascent was perfectly smooth or not. A ricocheting bullet snapped off the shuttle's hull with a spang. To the people inside, it sounded like a mallet blow. Two men were running out of the mansion, toting rifles. The alarm had been raised at last, it would appear. They were both firing at a run, which meant their shooting was far from accurate. Not only that, but they must know their rounds would not penetrate the skin of a spacecraft designed with sufficient armoring to protect it from micrometeors and other small colliding objects. Presumably, they thought it was better to waste the bullets than have to admit to Covington later that they'd done nothing whatsoever to prevent the shuttle taking off. Inara poured on speed. The shuttle veered away from the mansion in a wide, yawing arc. Hades, Elmira said. They're on Hades. 28. Kaylee looked for work to occupy her mind. There was no end of that to be found aboard Serenity, but the distraction of a simple involving task wasn't always sufficient. As she started lubricating a flanged coupler gasket on the transverse manipulator hose, digging her fingers into a bucket of grease, the cogs in her head resumed their unhappy circular turning. After Serenity had been flying for an hour with the cargo bay door wide open, Kaylee and Jane had donned spacesuits and gone down to check on the condition of the payload. Exposed to the negative 270 degrees Celsius chill of the deep black, ambient condensation now coated everything in the cargo bay. Every surface, every deck plate, bulkhead, and piece of machinery with a shimmering onion-skin-thin layer of frost. It was like being inside a twinkling, multifaceted jewel. The only objects in the entire place that were clear of ice were the crates of HTX-20 themselves. Their warmth had prevented the frost from forming on them, but a quick scan had shown Kaylee that the explosives within had cooled considerably, almost back to the temperature they'd originally been at when they'd come aboard. It had worked, and that was all the more remarkable an achievement because it was an idea suggested by Jane Cobb. Kaylee had closed the cargo bay door, and Atmo had slowly begun hissing back into the ship's bowels. Now she wiped the sweat from her brow at the back of her hand, smearing a band of grease across it. She was worried sick about Mal and would start to sniffle quietly every time she thought about what he might be suffering, the more so when she allowed herself to entertain the notion that he might already be dead and lost to them forever. There was still no word from Book or Inara, still no update on Mal's likely whereabouts, and on top of that, Kaylee was afraid that the crew wouldn't be able to survive this dangerous mission without Mal's guidance. He had a way of seeing past trouble and finding a path to safety, even in the direst of situations. Zoe's voice crackled through the calm. Kaylee, we need you to recheck the cargo, make sure it stopped simmering. Kaylee cleaned her hands on a rag and tossed it in the general direction of the trash can. She didn't really want to go back near the explosives, but at least it was something to do. Twenty nine. After Stuart Deacons left, Mal examined every inch of his cell, searching for a way to escape. If he could find a weakness in a wall or a soft spot in the floor, maybe he could burrow his way out with his heels. He found nothing, just solid, bare rock. Then he tested the mesh door, applying pressure first with his shoulder, then with his feet from a seated position, legs straight out in front of him. He could budget some, but not nearly as much as he would have liked. Not enough to give him hope that he could force the door out of its frame with brute strength or even bend it slightly out of true so as to create a gap he might wriggle through. Accepting the futility of escape, he propped himself in the corner with his elbows bent, his fastened hands in the small of his back, his knees nestled against his chest. He dozed off a few times in this awkward position. He was exhausted, but kept snapping awake. Cramping in his shoulders wouldn't let him rest for long. He eased out the discomfort as best he could, but invariably it returned. Approaching footfalls echoed down the tunnel. They sounded purposeful. 
Mal hoped it was Deacon's again. Perhaps something of what Mal had said to him had filtered through to the reservoir of good which he was sure still resided in the man. Perhaps Deacon's conscience had been fully awakened, and he was even now coming to set Mal free. No such luck. The new arrivals were David Zuburi, David's wife Sonia, and the hatchet-faced woman from before. Howdy, David, Mal said. Sonia? And you? He looked at Hatchet Face. Well, I know you and I have met, but we haven't been formally introduced. This ain't no social gathering, she retorted. But for your information, my name's Harriet Kyle. Miss or Mrs.? She kicked him in the ribs. Her boots must have had steel toe caps because it hurt unreasonably. In strained tones, Mal said, I'll take that as a check in the neither of the above box. Your trial's starting, David said, up on your feet. Mal struggled upright. I thought we were waiting on some latecomers. We still are, Sonia said. They're en route and should be here soon, but Toby couldn't hang on any longer, nor could anyone else. The low tunnel ceiling seemed to press down on Mal's sore shoulders as he walked between his guards back to the cavern. There, a banjo was playing, and people were belting out the Independence battle hymn with all the zeal of a platoon of browncoats after a victory. Browncoats look up to the skies. Browncoats hail the dawn. Today we'll see tyranny dying with the morn. Browncoats, are you weary? Browncoats, rise and sing. Your time has come, your war is won. Victory takes wing. The battle hymn had heartened Mal on many a hopeless-seeming night. On this occasion, his spirits were not lifted. The song seemed more like an accusation than a rallying cry. David, Sonia, and Harriet escorted him through the crowd to the old disused drilling rig and shoved him up the stairs. On the platform beside it, Toby Finn stood with his arms outstretched, almost as though he was conducting the music. Mal kept his face impassive, wondering all the while just how short and one-sided this trial was going to be. All right, brown coats, simmer down, Toby said, spying Mal and his escort. The moment we've been waiting for is here. The group burst into cheers, raising their hands above their heads, high-fiving each other, applauding. Mal looked for Stuart Deacons. Their gazes met. Deacons looked away. Toby gestured for the browncoats to be quiet, and eventually they wore themselves out. Then Mal's former friend said, I declare this trial open. A few stray hurrahs were quickly quashed. Aware that eyes were on him, Mal maintained his neutral expression, fixing it on like an iron mask. Here's how this will work, Toby said. I will call witnesses and present evidence against the accused. And the accused will defend himself. He slid a glance towards Mal, since no one volunteered to defend you. What are the charges? Mal asked. You are out of turn, Toby snapped. You will speak when you are invited to. Do you understand? Mal said nothing. I said, do you understand? Oh, hey, were you inviting me to speak? Said Mal. I'm really not clear on the protocols. This is all new to me. Never had to defend myself in a trial before. That drew a few chuckles, most of them derisive, but one or two amused. Toby narrowed his eyes and wagged a finger. Mal got the message. No playing to the gallery. Although, if that would save his life, he'd do it, of course. Toby cleared his throat. Malcolm Reynolds formerly of the 57th Overlanders, you come before this court facing four major charges. One, high treason against the independent planets. Two, murder. Three, sabotage during wartime. And four, collaboration with the enemy. He counted off the alleged crimes on his fingers. Three of the charges carry with them the penalty of death. The charge of sabotage carries with it the sentence of life imprisonment without possibility of parole. He stared intently at Mal. Do you understand these charges? 
Since arriving in the mine, Mal had not been this physically close to Toby before, and as he held Toby's gaze, he realized that his former friend was not simply much thinner than he remembered. He was sick. His eyes were bloodshot and his skin was sallow, his cheeks tinted gray. His brown coat hung loose on him. During those years that they had lost touch, what had happened to the strong, fearless fighter Mal had known? Or for that matter, the puppy eager youngster. Mal realized that this was not the time for flippancy. Not now. He needed to step up and tackle Toby head on, meeting fire with fire, else he was doomed. Doomed as a rat in a nest of rattlesnakes. I mean no disrespect, but I do not understand the charges at all, he said. This ain't a true trial. Where's the jury of my peers? Where's the judge in robes? Don't see none of those. Just some jumped-up veteran spouting trumped-up charges in a room full of folks who ought to know better, lapping up his words like it's mother's milk. Listen to me, Tobias Finn, and listen good. We have history, you and I. We both know it. We both know we did things back on Shadow that neither of us is best proud of. I'm not referring to how we misbehaved and got up the noses of Sheriff Bundy, Deputy Crump, and all those other stick-up-their-ass types in Seven Pines Pass. I don't recollect any of that with anything but fondness. They were good times. It's Ginny Adair I'm referring to specifically. Something sparked in Toby's eyes, briefly there and gone. And if it's any consolation, Mal said, I'm sorry. Truly I am. It was never my intention for anyone to get hurt, least of all you. Grimness tightened Toby's face. The charges have been read, he said. Toby. Shut up. I know, Mal. I know. What do you know? That you're guilty. Guilty as sin. That's it? You know? That's all I need. It's all any of us here needs. Is it? Because I look out over this gathering and I don't see the same certainty on all of the faces. He could tell that Stu Deacons was harboring doubts if the way Deacons couldn't meet his eye was anything to go by not to mention the benevolence he had shown back in the cell. And David Zuburi, who had earlier tried to restrain his wife from hurting Mal, was shuffling his feet. A couple of others seemed less firm in their resolve than the rest. It appeared that there were vigilantes here thinking for themselves, and that not everyone was 100% convinced of Mal's guilt. This could yet evolve into a real trial, despite the presence of a hanging judge. Maybe if we just, you know, hash this out, Mal went on. We might come to some resolution about how things happened from your point of view and from mine. I can't help but think there's been a massive misunderstanding. That is not how we are doing this, Toby shouted, overriding him. Just kill him now, shouted one of the onlookers. We know. You don't know anything, Mal shot back, or I would not be standing here falsely accused. I would have given my life to our cause, and there's people here who can be in no doubt about that. He found Deacons again and focused in on him. And I don't know what has happened in your life since to make you this hard-hearted and bitter, but I guarantee you killing me ain't gonna make you feel better. You shut the hell up, Sonia Zuburi shrieked at him. Do not try to confuse us, Malcolm Reynolds. We have searched the verse for you, and you will not escape justice. Justice has not shaken hands with any of us. Mal said. In a just verse, we would have won. You saw the brown coats were going down at Serenity Valley, and you cut your losses and ran, Mal, Toby said, seizing the reins of the conversation, like a rat off a sinking ship. Huh? I never did anything of the kind. You did, Sonia shouted. I challenge you to prove even one iota of that statement to be true, Mal said and Toby smiled a sickly, sinister smile. The smile of a fanatic so convinced of his own righteousness that no power in the verse would dissuade him from it. Oh, I shall. I shall. Toby waved a hand out at the crowd. And you will understand, my fellow browncoats, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we've got the right man, and we will be doing the right thing. Thirty. The Planet Shadow, Long Ago 
Mal, Mal, they have Jamie. Ginny Adair came galloping on horseback across the field where Mal was working, breaking up the rocky, hard-packed soil for planting. Mal cut the motor on the rotavator and mopped sweat from his brow with his sleeve. Who has Jamie, he said. Ginny reined in. Bundy, Crump, they cornered him outside Camacho's grain and feed, said they'd had a call about someone shoplifting. Jamie was coming out lugging a sack of cob nuts. He said to Bundy he'd paid for them fair and square, and if he was a shoplifter, he'd steal something way less bulky than a 40-pound bag of horse feed. Bundy and Crump took him away at gunpoint anyway. Who told you this? Cat Camacho herself. She saw it all and called me straight away. Bundy's had a mad on for Jamie ever since we tried busting Willard Krieger out of jail. Had a mad on for all of us, Mal said, recalling the number of times either Bundy or Crump or both of them had hassled him in the street, at the Silver Stirrup, lots of other places, while he was innocently going about his business. Several times Bundy had baldly stated his desire to run Mal and the other amigos out of town, or worse. He was itching for some payback after the humiliation of the jailbreak incident and Marla Finn's thwarting his attempted prosecution of the culprits. This campaign of harassment had been going on for months, and all of the four amigos had done their best to ride it out, hoping the sheriff and his sidekick would tire of it eventually. But now Bundy seemed to have ratcheted things up a gear. They'd taken him to the jail, he said. I don't know. That'd be the first place to look, I guess. Okay, let me get a horse and saddle up. No time, you can ride with me. Mal heaved himself up behind Jenny, and she spun her horse round and spurred it into motion. It was no hardship sitting with his arms around Jenny's trim waist, her back against his chest, smelling her lavender-scented perfume at close range, and a slight but heady tinge of sweat beneath it. Despite the circumstances, Mal wished the ride could have lasted longer. He'd had only sporadic contact with the Adairs since the jailbreak, and practically none at all with Toby. As far as he knew, Ginny and Toby were still an item, but in that moment, feeling this strong, beautiful woman in front of him, so capable, so determined, Mal's passion for her was rekindled. There was nothing he wanted more in the world, in the verse, than Ginny Adair. The town jail was locked up, empty. The sheriff's office was shut, too. Mal and Ginny made inquiries all over town, and eventually they learned that Bundy and Crump had driven out of Seven Pines Pass in their official police hover cruiser, headed towards Sageville on Arroyo Road. Mal and Ginny raced in pursuit. They had no idea what the police officers' plans were for Jamie, but they were sure Bundy and Crump intended no good. Four miles out of town, they came across the hover cruiser parked by the roadside. Three sets of footprints led away from the vehicle out into the wilderness. We walk from here, Mal said, dismounting. Why? Riding it'd be faster. Noisier, too. My hunch is it's better if they don't hear us coming. We can get the drop on them, then. Ginny dismounted, too, and tethered her horse, then accompanied Mal as he began following the trail of footprints. Sheriff Bundy's heavier, deeper tread was discernible on the right of the three. The man could do with losing several pounds, and Mal could only assume the trudging set of footprints in the middle were Jamie's. The two police officers were manhandling Jamie along between them. This had all the hallmarks of a prisoner being walked towards the gallows. Suddenly, Mal gestured at Jenny to hunker down. He had heard voices up ahead. They crept forward on all fours through the sagebrush until they caught sight of Bundy and Crump standing beside a tall mesquite tree. Jamie was with them, and he had a noose around his neck. Ginny bit back a gasp of horror. They wouldn't, Mal hushed her. They won't, he whispered. Not if I have anything to do with it. As they watched, Bundy was jeering at Jamie, whose hands were cuffed behind his back. This has been a long time coming, kid. Ever since the Finn woman got you off the hook, you and your deadbeat pals have been asking for it. Now the chickens are coming home to roost. You're not going to do this, Sheriff, Jamie said. It wasn't clear if he was making a prediction or a wish. You wouldn't dare. You're just trying to scare me. Am I? Yeah, and just so as you know, it's working. I'm scared, okay? So can we call it off now? You've accomplished what you set out to. Crump tugged on the rope, cinching the noose that little bit tighter around Jamie's neck. 
The rope was slung over a bow of the mesquite tied off around the tree's trunk. Have you got a gun? Jenny asked Mal. Nope, only a knife. You? No, didn't think to bring one. I was too panicked. It's probably for the best. Don't want to give Bundy and Crump cause to shoot us in self-defense. Not that they'd need much excuse by the looks of things. What are you going to do? You have a plan? Definitely. Is it a good one? Definitely not. Just stay low. When I give the signal, move. Move where? I don't know, just do something. Mal? Yeah? She kissed him. Just once, lightly, an inch to the side of his lips. It made him feel ten feet tall. Mal rose from the sagebrush, waving his arms over his head. Oh, hi there, Sheriff. Deputy, he said at the top of his voice. Fancy bumping into you guys out here in the middle of nowhere. As one, Bundy and Crump turned and drew on him. Whoa, Mal said, striding out towards them. Easy, fellas. I'm not packing, as you can see. I'm here to parley. I see that we have what some would call a good old-fashioned lynching. What you see, said Bundy, not lowering his gun, is the due process of the law. We caught Jamie Adair red-handed in the commission of an act of thievery. We are well within our rights to sentence and punish him in the manner of our choosing. Not sure I recall there being a trial. Not sure I care what you think, Reynolds. You could say my deputy and I are teaching you owl hoots a lesson. We're fed up to the back teeth with your games and your tomfoolery. I run an orderly town and I won't stand for any sort of misbehavior. And you know what? Deputy Crump chimed in. When the Alliance comes and incorporates Shadow into the Union, and it's going to happen any day now, you'll find there'll be even stricter law enforcement. Those Alliance folk don't tolerate troublemakers. We've seen it on some of the Red Sun planets already. Alliance troops cracking down on anyone as gets too uppity. They call them insurgents, but we all know they're just crooks and criminals. And what do they call that cracking down, said Bundy? They call it a police action. So we, as police ourselves, are only emulating their example. Starting with you, miscreants. Mal shrugged. I tell you, Sheriff... I had already been given thought to joining up with the independents. Seems as though you've just pushed me a few steps further in that direction. But let's not bring politics into this. Let's keep things strictly personal. How's about this? You take that there noose off of Jamie, then we all shake hands and walk away. No harm, no foul. Or how's about I just plant a bullet in you right now, said Bundy, on account of your committing an obstruction of justice. What do you say, Orville? Reckon that'd fly? Reckon it'd fly right nicely, said Crump. Better still, you can halt there, Reynolds, exactly where you are. Don't come a step nearer. Mal did his bidden in the full knowledge that either Bundy or Crump would drill a hole in him if he disobeyed. He was now within ten paces of the mesquite tree and somewhat closer to Crump than to Bundy. Good boy, said Bundy. Stay put and you can watch your pal Jamie dangle, knowing there ain't a thing you can do about it knowing, too, that it'll be your turn next. Jamie cast Mal a frantic look. Both of them had come to the same realization. Bundy and Crump were not kidding around. This was not all just some piece of theater. They were going to go through with the hanging. Because they could. Because they were the law. Because the prospect of war in the verse, which over the past few weeks had become less of a possibility and more of a cast-iron certainty, seemed to have given them the courage to act as intemperately and self-indulgently as they liked. Because when chaos loomed, reason and accountability went out of the window. Behind his back, Mal flapped his hand at Jenny. He trusted she would interpret the gesture correctly. He was telling her to get out of there. Nothing was to be gained by her remaining. He and Jamie were as good as dead. No point her making it three for three. In the event, the vagueness of his plan, the non-existence of it really, worked against him. Jenny, instead of fleeing, stood up out of the sagebrush. Well, 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 said Bundy, pushing his wide-brimmed hat back on his head with the barrel of his pistol. Looky here. Got the whole gang just about, apart from the Finn brat. Now we got us a proper audience. Ain't no one gonna be more upset about Jamie Adair's neck getting stretched than his kid's sister. 
Please, Sheriff Bundy, I'm begging you, Jenny said. Let him go. You got something you want to bargain with, girl? Bundy's leer made it patently obvious what he was hinting at. Because tempting though that'd be, I think I'd much rather watch you watch your brother die. Talk about satisfying. Orville, I'll keep my gun trained on these two. You set about doing what needs to be done. Deputy Crump holstered his sidearm and unlashed the rope from the tree trunk. Then he took the strain and started to pull, using the trunk like a pulley to mitigate the weight on the other end of the rope. Jamie's feet left the ground. His legs kicked. The noose tightened and he began making horrendous choking gargling noises. His face rapidly purpled. Mel knew he had one shot at this. He might die as a consequence. He might die even before he was able to achieve what he was setting out to do. But either of those fates was better than allowing Bundy and Crump to get away unopposed with what was unarguably cold-blooded murder. He whisked his knife from its sheath and slung it through the air. The blade cleaved clean through the rope inches above Jamie's head. Sheriff Bundy's attention had been divided between Mal and Jenny. Hence, he was slow getting off a shot at Mal. So slow that Mal had time to duck out of the way, even as Jamie tumbled to the ground. Deputy Crump also fell as the rope was cut and went slack in his hands. Suddenly, with nothing to counterbalance him, his strenuous pulling was converted into strenuous falling backwards. He sprawled in the dust. Mal pounced, planting a knee on Crump's chest to pin him down, then slid the deputy's gun out of its holster. He drew a bead on Bundy, cocking the hammer. Standoff. Ginny ran to Jamie's side and released the noose. Jamie rolled over, retching and wheezing. Bundy eyed Mal beadily. You won't, boy. You don't have the stones. You ain't never shot no one in your life, and the last person you're gonna start with is a lawman. Or maybe, said Mal, the first. And he fired. Neither Ginny nor Jamie could believe it. Same went for Crump, who stared up at Mal aghast. Even Mal himself was a little surprised. It was as though some part of him had known he had no choice, while another part reeled in astonishment. Bundy went down like a sack of coal. For several long moments, Mal was convinced the sheriff was dead. He hadn't known he had it in him to kill someone. Now he understood what it took. The right motivation, the right mix of necessity and desire. This was it. He had crossed a bridge he could not cross back. His life from now on would never be the same. Then Bundy hauled himself up into a sitting position. Go ram ow, he cried, clutching his shoulder. That hurts like a tama de hundan. Not dead, just wounded. Mal didn't know how he felt about that. Relieved, yes, but not entirely. You moron, Reynolds, Crump exclaimed, still pinned under Mal's knee. We weren't really going to hang him. Huh? You expect me to believe you? Believe what you want, it's true. Sure is, said Bundy. You think we'd be able to get away with something like that? Especially not with that fancy talking lawyer bitch Finn woman around. Nope, all's we were doing is giving a dare a scare. I've heard tell it can take a man up to six minutes to pass out during a short drop hanging, twenty minutes till he's actually dead. We weren't gonna let him dangle more than a minute or so. Making a point, said Crump, teaching him a lesson, teaching all of you lot. Some goram lesson, Jamie croaked. Sure looked to me like you were gonna go through with it, Mal said. And to me, said Jenny. Wouldn't have been effective if it hadn't been convincing, said Bundy. And that stuff about hanging me as well, said Mal. That just big talk too? Damn straight, said Bundy. Mal rose to his feet. Okay, he said. Fact remains, you crossed a line, both of you. As did you, Reynolds, said Crump, shooting an officer of the law. Mal turned the gun on him. I can always make it two officers of the law, want that? Crump gulped and shook his head. Then shut up and listen. I reckon we all need to come to some sort of accommodation here. This is my proposal. Events went as follows. You, Sheriff Bundy, and you, Deputy Crump, 
came out into the wilds in order to carry out some target practice. There was an accident. Crump discharged his gun, this very one in my hand, and wounded his superior officer. That's it. No attempted hanging, bogus hanging, whatever it was. Jamie, Ginny, and I weren't even here. What do you say? Sound reasonable? Bundy's expression was steely. Blood oozed out over the fingers of the hand he was pressing against the bullet hole. Finally, he said, Seems as though I don't have a choice. You do. You can choose not to go along with what I'm suggesting, and both you and your buddy Orville will find yourselves in shallow graves in the shade of this very tree. You think I'm not serious? I wasn't aiming to wound you just now, Bundy. I was aiming to kill. And now that I've started down that road, don't see as how I'm liable to stop. There won't be any witnesses to your deaths, at least none that'll testify against me. Ain't that right, Ginny? Jamie? Sister and brother both nodded resolutely. There we go, said Mal. But just to make sure the three of us walk away unharmed and you don't get it into your heads to shoot us in the back, we're going to empty your gun of its shells, Sheriff, and this one as well, and take your ammo belts. When that was done and Mal had unlocked the handcuffs on Jamie using the key from Crump's belt, he and the Adair siblings took their leave of the lawmen, heading back to the road. While Jenny got back on her horse, Mal hotwired the police cruiser and drove it off with Jamie in the passenger seat. There seemed nothing to be gained by making it easy for Bundy and Crump to get back to town. Mal, Jamie said, how can I ever thank you? You don't need to. You'd have done the same for me. I would have at that. He fingered the line of rope burn on his neck. I knew Bundy'd been getting more and more out of control lately. I just never realized he might take it as far as he did. Think he's gone a little crazy. Think the whole verse is going a little crazy. Bundy's craziness, just a byproduct of that. Yeah, I wouldn't have put it past him to kill me, though. Wasn't any doubt in my mind but that I was a goner. But now you've interfered, he's only going to hate us all the more. That was some fancy knife throwing, by the way. I was aiming for Crump, Mal said. Really? Yeah, and I'd have got him, too, if that damn rope hadn't gotten in the way. They both laughed. Listen, were you being serious back there? Jamie said about signing up with the independents. I'm giving it some proper thought. Crump wasn't wrong about how the Alliance is behaving on the Red Sun worlds and elsewhere. As you can see from what I did to him, I would seem to have a problem with authority riding roughshod over people. Guess that sentiment extends way beyond Seven Pines Pass, Shadow, the Georgia system, all the way out into the wider verse. Besides, ain't as if there's much going on for me here. Just farm work, ranching, the day-to-day -day grind... A call of adventure, huh? Something like that. Got me a feeling that I'm hearing it too, Jamie said. Maybe it takes a brush with death to put things into perspective. If you threw in with the independents, I might just too. There's a recruiting office open up in Da Changshi, I heard. I heard that too. I'm not sure how I'd break it to my parents. Same with me and my mother. It might be best if we just didn't. Simply hop the train to Da Changshi without telling them. You think Jenny would join us? I'm not sure how she feels about the whole situation. She doesn't much like the Alliance, that's for sure, but I reckon it'd be better if she stays at home anyway, for our parents' sake. One child running off like as to get himself killed is bad enough, but both of them? Yeah, I see your point. But Mal might quite have liked it, were Ginny to have come along with them to Da Chengxi. Might have quite liked to spend some time in close proximity to her, without Toby around. See what developed. You don't think we'd be running away, do you? Jamie said. What do you mean? From Bundy. Because if I know that man, he's going to be sticking to our agreement for a while, but when his shoulder's better, when he's back on his feet, he'll be fuming. He won't let it rest. He'll come after us again. You think? I think he's licked and he knows it. Maybe you're right. You've always been the confident one, Mal. Or, Mal thought, the one who doesn't think things through or care about the repercussions... They abandoned the police cruiser on the outskirts of Seven Pines Pass and walked the rest of the way in. Jamie announced that the drinks were on him and they headed straight for the Silver Stirrup, where Ginny caught up with them later. It turned into one of the epic drinking sessions of Mal's life. Five straight hours of necking beers and whiskey chasers and laughing uproariously with the Adair siblings. And when it was over, Jamie staggered homeward in the dark, while Ginny accompanied Mal to the Reynolds Ranch 
leading her horse because she was far too inebriated to ride. What happened next was as inevitable as it was in hindsight, regrettable. They got as far as the bluff overlooking town. Next thing they knew, they were kissing. Next thing they knew after that, Ginny had laid out her horse's saddle blanket on the ground. Beneath the stars on a hot night, with all three of Shadow's moons on the rise and a slight cooling breeze, they made love. It was sweet and fierce, tender and spectacular, unforgettable. Afterwards, as they lay together with Ginny's head cradled in Mal's arm, she said, We shouldn't have done that. What, taken the Lord's name in vain as much as we just did? No, I mean it. Her face was serious. Toby and I, we're still together. As far as he's concerned, we're a couple. I think he's going to ask me to marry him. He keeps mentioning engagement rings and stuff and looking at houses for sale. That does surely seem like the talk of someone with marriage on their mind. What do you think about it? I think I love Toby, but I don't love, love him, if you see the difference. The difference being two loves instead of one? Can you ever not be facetious? If I knew the meaning of the word, I'd know what I wasn't supposed to be. So if Toby proposes, I'll say no and crush him forever. Don't say that, Jenny snapped. Please, don't. You know it's true. I like Toby. When he gets wrapped up in a girl, there ain't nothing to untangle him easily. Not without it hurting him plenty. Especially a girl like you. But I can't say yes if... He isn't the man I want to be with for the rest of my life. Mal wondered if he might be the man Ginny would want to be with for the rest of her life. He didn't dare voice the thought for fear that he would be as crushed as Toby was going to be when Ginny rejected his proposal. Whatever happens, Ginny said firmly, this thing tonight, you and me, it was a one-off. You hear me, Mal? It was terrific, it was lovely, but it's not going to be repeated. So what, this was just my reward for saving your brother? No, no, I need to figure out where I stand with Toby, apart from anything else. Mal was crestfallen. He was also quite sure within himself that despite what she said, it was not going to be a one-off. And he was right. He and Ginny kept contriving to be in the same place at the same time, their paths crossing seemingly by accident, but not really. These random encounters all had the same outcome, and there would be guilt afterwards and a vow not to see each other again, invariably broken. Naturally, Toby was appalled when he learned about what Bundy had done or tried to do, and said he would inform his mother. She would have Bundy out of a job within a week and sue him for damages, too. Mal and Jamie, however, persuaded him not to tell her. They reckoned Bundy was neutralized, Crump as well, both lawmen were so far sticking to the story Mal had concocted about a firearms accident. Both were getting ribbed for it by the locals and were taking the mockery stoically. Their feigned chagrin suggested to Mal that they wanted to put the truth of the incident behind them, and involving Marla Finn might just stir up something that appeared settled. If Bundy were plotting any kind of revenge, he was hiding it well. Maybe, for all of his pig-headedness, even he realized he had overstepped the mark and needed to pull back. Then war broke out on Shadow. The Alliance had been pushing its influence further and further out from the core, sweeping up more and more planets in its barbed wire embrace. All across the verse, there had been skirmishes between Alliance troops and opposition forces, ragtag militias that were poorly armed but made up for it with guts and determination. It was war in all but name, until finally the Alliance declared that a state of hostility existed between it and all worlds that resisted its influence. This was simply formalizing what had hitherto been implicit. By then, Ginny had broken it off with Toby. She had also broken it off with Mal. Toby did not know that they had been seeing each other behind his back, but Ginny felt she could not simply take up with Mal, not so soon after ending things with Toby. She said she needed time out to think about their relationship and figure out what she herself wanted, promising it was just temporary. She was still bruised and fragile from having to jilt Toby. It had not been an easy decision. 
Toby came to Mal for consolation, and one of the hardest feats Mal had ever pulled off was offering the kid a shoulder to cry on. He ached to tell Toby about himself and Ginny, but knew he never could. He couldn't shake off the feeling that he had lost her. Instead, he comforted Toby, got him drunk, was every inch the good friend. Next day, he found himself on that train to Da Cheng Shi. Jamie was with him. So was Toby. Once again, as before during the heyday of the Four Amigos, Toby was tagging along. His motives were straightforward. He couldn't bear to remain in Seven Pines Pass. He couldn't stay as long as Ginny was there, a constant reminder of what he had once had and could never have again. He hated the Alliance, that was for sure. He detested what they were doing. He wanted to stand up and be counted, to give those bullies a bloody nose, to draw a line in the sand. But whereas for Mal and Jamie that was reason enough to do what they were doing, Toby was driven by a still darker imperative. Misery. Once more, Toby addressed the crowd of brown coats in the mining cavern. Here is how it went down, he said. Less than a year after Mal and I enlisted, along with our friend Jamie Adair, the Alliance bombed the hell out of our home planet, Shadow. By then, we'd all been through basic training. You all know how that was. Sometimes brutal, sometimes boring, sometimes downright amateurish. But we were all pulling together, all on the same side. It felt good even when we were slogging along knee-deep in mud, trying to keep formation, pretending to fire these broom handles they'd given us instead of guns because they didn't have any real guns to spare, aiming them at an enemy that wasn't there. Yet. Then came a lull. Our drill sergeants, some of whom seemed to be just making it up as they went, told us to go home. They taught us all they could. They would summon us when we were needed. The war was drawn closer to shadow every day, like this big thundercloud on the horizon steadily growing bigger and bigger, more and more ominous. We were told to go be with our loved ones for a spell and wait for the call. It'd be coming soon enough. Mal, Jamie, and I returned to Seven Pines Pass, our hometown. Jamie's sister, Jenny, was waiting to meet us off the train, and she wasn't happy with any of us. No, sir, on account of we'd up and left her behind without telling her where we were going, and she'd had to find out about it the hard way, through a wave from Jamie. Each of us had our reasons for keeping her in the dark, the details of which needn't detain us here. However, Jenny and a few of the locals were keen to do their bit, and so they'd begun stockpiling arms, against the likelihood of the Alliance occupying Shadow. They'd put together a sizable cache, enough to equip a platoon or maybe more, and had stashed it out back of a meadow on the Adair property in a cow shed. Mal remembered that cow shed for various reasons. One was that he and Ginny had met there for a tryst on several occasions. The smell of mingled cow musk and hay never failed to evoke strong feelings in him, even to this day. Sometimes it was almost, in a bizarre way, an aphrodisiac. Other times it could reduce him to tears. He also remembered the cowshed for the smoking ruin it had become, all twisted spars of charred wood sticking upwards with a halo of scorched earth around it, and for the burned, mutilated corpse lying close by. Ginny's and Jamie's parents knew what was being kept there, Toby continued, but turned a blind eye. Ginny took it upon herself to guard the arms cache round the clock. It was her way of showing support for the independent cause. And here's the kicker. She was guarding it that night when the Alliance called in a Zeus missile strike to destroy it. She was there when a space-to-ground projectile fitted with a thousand pounds of explosive sailed in from heaven and obliterated that cow shed and everything in it and everything within a hundred-yard radius around it, including Jenny. Faces stared up at the platform, and Mal stared at nothing. All he saw was Jenny's dead body, burned into a contorted skeletal parody of its living version. The face, like a blackened skull, jaws opened in a soundless scream. The cindered remains that were barely recognizable as those of the first woman he'd ever truly loved. 
All these years, Mal had assumed that rage had burned away the last of his deep grief. But now his heart sank down into another icy pit, brimming with sorrow so thick he began to drown. Couldn't breathe. Couldn't think. The crowd had fallen silent, as if in respect for the dead. Exhausted, out of gas, Mal hung his head and mourned everything that had happened between Ginny and him, and everything that had not happened. After a long moment, Toby stretched out a hand and pointed at Mal. When they told him that she'd died, the first words out of the mouth of Malcolm Reynolds were, she was supposed to be safe. Mal recalled the moment. Those were his exact words, spoken to Jamie and Toby. Someone, he forgot who, came running into the silver stirrup to announce the missile strike. They'd all heard the detonation not ten minutes earlier and seen the accompanying far-off flash in the sky. And they all had speculated what it signified, whether it was simply the onset of a thunderstorm or something more sinister. The moment they learned it was a missile aimed at the Adair Ranch, they sprinted out that way. The farmhouse itself was intact, save for the fact that every single window pane in it had been blown out and the roof was missing several shingles. Mr. and Mrs. Adair were likewise shaken but unhurt. However, no sooner did Mal see the impact site and Jenny's body than he fell to his knees and uttered the sentence Toby had just quoted. What he didn't grasp was why it mattered, what significance she was supposed to be safe carried for Toby. That was when Toby slid a hand into his pocket and retrieved a small rounded lump of metal that had been distorted out of its original shape by intensely high temperatures. It was roughly the size and shape of a fob watch and for a moment Mal could not fathom what it was or why Toby had produced it. Then it dawned on him. It was the locket, the gold locket with the ornate J, the one he hadn't given to Ginny and then later, much later, had. Toby levered open the lid with some difficulty. The hinge barely worked. Inside was a mass of circuitry fused into so much silvery goo. See that, everyone? He displayed the locket to the crowd. See that, Mal? A homing beacon. The homing beacon that you put there. The homing beacon which gave the Alliance the exact coordinates for the arms cache. Thanks to you, they couldn't miss. Thanks to you, Ginny Adair died. 31. Hades, said Zoe, leaning over the comms panel on Serenity's bridge. You sure that's right, Book? That's what Elmira says, Book replied. His voice crackled, distance distorting the signal. As in the lesser of Persephone's two moons, said Wash, sibling to the larger, brighter Renau, and usually part eclipsed by it. Sure, said Zoe. But what in hell are they doing on Hades? There's nothing there. I think that's kind of the point, said Book. If you take someone prisoner and have malicious designs on them, the best place to spirit them off to is somewhere remote and undesirable, somewhere no one goes. And the intel sound? Elmira has nothing to gain by lying. Put it this way, Hunter Covington enslaved her, abused her, threatened to kill her. It isn't in her interests to cover for him. In fact, her exact words were, if your friends catch up with him and manage to put a bullet in him, I'm not going to shed a single tear. Well, you can tell her from me, Zoe said. If I see him, I'll do just that. Him and anyone else involved in Mal's kidnapping. I'm already plotting a course towards Hades, Shepard, Wash said, stabbing buttons on the control console. Just one question. Where precisely on Hades? Any idea? Because it's not the biggest rock in the verse, but it's not the smallest either, and if we don't have any clear idea where to put down, we could be searching a long time. I asked Elmira that myself. She doesn't know, but you'll find the location, Wash. I'm sure of it. If I do, it'll be some kind of miracle. Miracles happen, said Book. Not in my experience, Wash muttered as Zoe cut the connection. He hit the ship's intercom. Kaylee? Yeah? How are the engines doing? 
Shiny-ish. Good enough, because I'm about to go for maximum burn. We think we know where Mal is. Oh my god, for real? Yep, you just make sure Serenity keeps Spaceborn. On it. Buckle up, honey, Wash said to Zoe. I'm going to give you the ride of a lifetime. Promises, promises, Zoe said, strapping herself into a seat. Wash thrust the yoke forward, and Serenity's tail end lit up like a Chinese lantern, coruscatingly bright. The ship diverted sleekly round onto her new course, Wash pouring on speed, extracting every ounce of thrust her engines could provide. Shouldn't take us more than an hour, he said to his wife, assuming nothing breaks or blows up. Zoe laid a hand on his arm. Just shut up and fly, Wash. This is what you do, so do it. 32. The Planet Shadow, Long Ago A week before Ginny died, Mel came over to her house and gave her the locket. What's this? She said, staring at the trinket. A love token? Yes, I mean, no. No, nothing like that. I saw it in a shop in Da Shi. He didn't say when he'd seen it. Saw the J on it and thought of you. Well, that's uh, mighty nice of you. Weren't it just? I want you to have it, not to remember me by or any of that stuff. That's not what this is about at all. Look inside. I've added a little something. Ginny pressed the tiny catch which opened the locket. Inside lay a gleaming knot of technology. It's... A hearing aid? She said, frowning at him, half smiling. A homing beacon, Mal said. And why do I need a homing beacon? Because when the war hits shadow, who knows where I'm going to end up. I may not even be planet side, and you may get called away too. I don't believe for one moment that you're going to stay put and tend to this arms cache of yours indefinitely. Those weapons will be gone soon enough, and the Ginny Adair I know isn't going to be content living at the old homestead splitting logs and shoveling cow dung. You got that right. No, she's going to become a, what are they calling us? A brown coat. Ain't such a pretty name, is it? Ginny said. No, and that reminds me. I need to buy myself a brown suede coat. Otherwise, I'm not going to fit in. But to my point, when you're a brown coat and I'm a brown coat, we could be light years apart at opposite ends of the verse. But that their homing beacon is linked to a matching homing beacon which I have in my safekeeping. And if ever we want to find each other or simply know where each other is, those two little doohickeys will be able to tell us. They're powered by thermoelectric energy, using the differential between body heat and the ambient temperature to keep them charged. As long as we're wearing them, they'll have juice. And if one of them stops working, well, then the next time the other person activates their beacon, they'll know the worst has happened. Oh, well. He couldn't tell if she was touched or perplexed. Then he saw tears falling from her eyes, splashing onto the locket. He took the trinket from her hands and draped it around her neck. Just wear it, he said. For me. Doesn't mean we're engaged to be wed or anything. Ain't that at all. No way, definitely nothing of the sort. But know that I will always have my own beacon with me at all times, whether or not you have yours. If I want to check if you're safe or you me, this is how. They kissed, and it was long, lingering, and over too soon. Then Ginny turned away from him and walked off, her head a little bowed, her step a little faltering, as though it was taking everything she had not to turn around and run back to his arms. May I speak, Mal said. I think it's my turn now. I'm owed the right of response. Hear, hear, said someone in the crowd. Mal wasn't sure, but it sounded a lot like Stuart Deacon's. Very well, said Toby with a great show of magnanimousness. That homing beacon wasn't anything to do with the Alliance, Mal said. Don't even know how you could think it might have been. I had a tech expert look over it. No question, it was designed to send out a location signal. You knew Ginny was guarding the arms cache 24-7. You gave her the beacon to lead the Alliance right to it. You might as well have painted crosshairs on her back. And why in hell would I do that, Toby? What would I get out of it? Ginny was my friend, my good friend. You saw me after we found the body. 
You saw how I was a Goram mess. For about a week after, I could barely speak. Came close to blowing my own brains out several times. That's how bad her death screwed me up. Oh, it was a fine display of grief you put on, that's for sure, Toby said. The rest of us were feeling it genuinely and showed it in our different ways. But no one could rival Mal Reynolds when it came to the histrionics. I ain't that good an actor. I'm not saying you were acting, Mal. I'm saying you just went over the top with it. You were torn up about Jenny, no question. But maybe you were so torn up because you knew you were the one responsible. Well, how am I supposed to argue against that kind of logic? Mal said, exasperated. Can't win either way. If I hadn't been upset, you'd be accusing me of not caring because I was her killer. Since I was upset, you're saying it's because I had a guilty conscience. Anyways, it was Sheriff Bundy who told the Alliance about the arms cache. Everybody thought so. It was a rumor, said Toby. A rumor you yourself, Mal, did a great deal to spread about. Bundy hated us. You, me, Jamie, and Ginny. We'd pissed him off dozens of times, and I'd maybe pushed it too far by wounding him with a bullet that time he tried to hang Jamie. Not that he didn't have it coming. He was looking at ways to hit back at us, and he knew what had hurt me, you, and Jamie more than anything would be killing Ginny. She was the glue that held the four of us together. If he wanted to destroy us, her death would do it. But he wasn't going to carry out the deed himself. Man was too cunning for that. If he could get the Alliance to do his dirty work for him, though and his hands would be clean, plus he'd be ingratiating himself with shadows soon to be overlords. And it worked, didn't it? Soon as Alliance troops stepped foot on shadow, some of them came down Seven Pines Passway, and next thing, the county governor had been executed on some spurious pretext, and Sheriff Bundy was appointed in his stead. It was almost like his fee for services rendered. Circumstantial, a theory, Toby said, you didn't have any proof that that was what happened. All it was was what you wanted everyone to believe was the case. If it was true, why didn't you go after Bundy? Believe me, I was tempted. If I'd had hard evidence he was to blame instead of just a strong suspicion, I'd have blown the bastard clean out of his socks. Before I could go about accumulating that evidence, however, High Command gave us our marching orders. And you know what? I was right glad to get the hell off of Shadow. Staying there a moment longer might have killed me. I've got a question for you, Toby Finn. How come you have that beacon at all? Wasn't it buried with Ginny? I found it when I helped ferry her to the town morgue, Toby replied. You weren't much use in that regard. You were too busy wailing and tearing your hair out and drenching yourself in misery so as everyone could see. Me and Jamie, we got on with the business of making sure Ginny got a decent burial. Once the ground around the cow's shed had cooled enough for us to pick up the body, that's what we did. And while we were moving her, I spied that locket and I got curious about it. it wasn't something I'd given her, her parents neither. I asked them later and even they didn't know how she'd come by it. So I took it off her body when no one was looking. Opened it up when I got home. Saw what was inside. I didn't know she'd got it from you, not then. All I knew was that someone had planted a beacon on Ginny without her knowing and had used her as a living target. And I vowed that when I found out who it was, nothing would stop me from exacting vengeance upon that individual. And at last, the day has come, a day I've been waiting for, looking forward to, dreaming of for more years than I care to think. And how can you be so sure it was me that did it, Mal said. I didn't have evidence pointing the finger at Sheriff Bundy, and you don't have none pointing it at me. Are you so sure, Mal? Toby sneered. I think you'll find I have plenty of evidence. But that beacon isn't what you think it was. Like I said, it wasn't anything to do with the Alliance. It was, before Mal could finish the sentence, there was a sudden ripple of activity amongst the assembled browncoats. Heads were turning. People were murmuring to one another. Somebody had just entered the cavern. Not just anyone either, but Hunter Covington, complete with Cobra Head Kane. Accompanying him was a person Mal also recognized, 
the man from Taggart's, the guy in the mustard yellow duster who'd sent him outside to get bushwhacked by Covington and his goons. A very good evening to you all, said Covington. Actually, that should be morning. Day's dawning out there, in case you hadn't realized. Sky was brightening just as we came into land. Looking like a peach of a day, and there is Mr. Malcolm Reynolds all trussed up and set to swing. Seems we arrived just in time, wouldn't you say, Harlow? Yellow Duster, Harlow, nodded in agreement. You are indeed just in time, gentlemen, Toby said. Just in time to watch one of the vilest men in brown coat history get his comeuppance. 33. Serenity swung into orbit around Hades. It was a smooth ball of rock a couple of hundred thousand miles from Persephone, rolling in a slow, lazy ellipse around its mother planet. There were a few mountain ranges, a few craters, but apart from those, it was featureless. Terraforming had been attempted, but all Hades had to show for it was atmosphere. Vegetation had failed. There had been no release of water from its frozen poles. Colonization had therefore been impossible, and the moon had been abandoned as a failed project, left to carry on along its way more or less unmolested. Since then, prospectors had sniffed around, digging down in the search for valuable minerals such as iridium, palladium, manganese, and molybdenum, not to mention platinum and gold. Yet again, however, Hades had proved disappointing, yielding nothing more valuable than iolite and ametrine, semi-precious gemstones, whose retail price was not high enough to justify the cost of their extraction. Nothing, Zoe said, surveying the moon's surface on the scanning screen. Nothing but wasteland. There was a note of despair in her voice. If there was maybe a building of some sort, Wash said, some sign of civilization, then we might have something to aim at. But there ain't. It's just a ghost world. Can you run a sweep? Already doing that. Thermal scan in a grid pattern with the gain turned way up high. If there's any kind of heat signature beyond natural background, it'll register. So far, nada. Jane entered the bridge, ducking under the lintel of the low doorway. That it, huh? He said, looking out at Hades through the viewing port array. Not much to write home about. If you don't have anything useful to contribute, Zoe said. Just saying. Seen more life in a three days dead dog. Well, somewhere down there? supposedly, then we got no chance of finding him, not unless we had a week to look, and I don't reckon we got nearly that long. Vigilantes will probably have plugged him already. Really, Jane, if you don't shut up, hey, Zoe, don't blame me if I'm the realist around here. Somebody has to be. Here's an idea. Let's just assume we are going to find Mal. We ought to make preparations. So why don't you go to your bunk, fetch out Vera, give her a good clean, and then she'll be all ready for if she's ever needed. Jane nodded. That ain't a half bad idea. He retreated out of the bridge. Wash said, Did you really just tell Jane to go to his bunk and polish his rifle? Uh-huh. You know he'll never realize that was a thinly veiled insult, right? Uh-huh. My God, woman, I so want to ravish you right now. Focus on the matter at hand, Wash. Too late. My mind has already gone down the dirty path. I'm thinking when this is over, you and me, we... Oh, wait, we just want she knew second. Something had flared on the thermal scan screen. Amidst the neutral grays and blues of Hades' surface, there was a tiny blob of glowing orange. Wash tapped instructions into a keyboard to enhance the image and zero in. Oh, yeah, attaboy. What is it? Zoe asked. Looks like the exhaust profile of a private yacht... Just landed, engines cycling down and the thrusters are cooling, but still radiating residual heat. Enough to get a fix on? Done. Coordinates logged in. Whose craft? My guess is Covington's. According to Elmira, Covington headed out to join the vigilantes in a yacht, didn't he? That's him down there, parked wherever they are. Book said miracles happen, Zoe murmured. And so does amazing piloting, said Wash. I'm calculating re-entry. Every moment counts. No time for slick and smooth, we're going in fast and we're going in hard. Zoe smirked. Is your mind still on the dirty path? Wash grinned. A little bit, he said, and yanked on the yoke.
34. Why are you even here? Mal called across the cavern to Hunter Covington. Don't reckon as you were ever a brown coat? How can you tell? Covington replied. On account of brown coats have integrity, and you don't. For what it's worth, I did my best to stay neutral during the war. Yeah, like most gutless profiteering streaks of Zhang Maoniao did. I was open to opportunities wherever they arose, Covington said. Still am. To nail your colors to a single mast is so limiting. Except you didn't nail your colors to a single mast after all, did you, Mal? In fact, you have no right to lecture me about integrity. Not if what Mr. Finn says about your past behavior is true, and I have no reason to believe it isn't. You have earned yourself a reputation around Evesdown and elsewhere as someone with a very elastic approach to ethics. Give Malcolm Reynolds a job, chances are he'll let you down or wind up screwing you over. That's what they say. Trust him no further than you could throw him. Couple of bad reviews. They stay with you forever, Mal said. Everyone ignores the many satisfied customers I've had. And to answer your question, I'm here because I was invited. I've been in cahoots with these here brown coat fellas for a while now, and I still haven't yet seen firsthand how they operate. As they were going to be on Hades, practically in my backyard, I thought I'd take up Mr. Finn's invitation and fly on over. It's always a good idea to learn as much as you can about a business partner's practices. And I guess maybe you got an appetite for summary executions as well, huh? Mal said. You get off on it. Covington shook his head firmly, but not that firmly. I'm not that barbaric. I can't deny, however, a certain curiosity. How will a man like you face up to death, Reynolds? With a wink and a quip, or blubbering in abject terror? I'd be curious myself to see how you manage it, Covington. Because I get the chance, you're the one who'll be facing up to death. Brave talk, considering how this trial appears to be almost at an end. Didn't I hear Mr. Finn just say you were about to get your comeuppance? Seems to me that sentence is shortly to be pronounced. Isn't that so, Mr. Finn? Toby Finn nodded. You're quite right, Hunter. In fact, as I told you, you couldn't have timed your arrival better. All that remains is for me to furnish the clinching proof that Mal killed Jenny Adair, and then we can get down to the punishment. I have that proof right here, but a little background first. Mal was just saying that we were called up to fight shortly after the Alliance attack on Shadow. It wasn't even a week, was it? Ginny only just planted in the ground, and troop carriers arrived to ship us out. Only when we were aboard did we learn which regiments we'd be joining. We'd had our skills assessed at boot camp and were assigned accordingly. Mal went to the 57th Overlanders, Jamie and I to the 19th Sunbeamers. Mal became a ground pounder, Jamie and I space commandos. The Sunbeamers acquitted themselves honorably in many a battle, so I hear, said Covington. I myself participated in dozens of ship-to-ship -ship actions. I took my fair share of Alliance scalps. But Jamie... Jamie was in a league of his own. That man fought with a righteous fury that burned hotter than a sun. Alliance had just killed his sister. He wasn't going to let them forget that. Jamie Adair never took a single prisoner. You were an Alliance trooper and got in his way, woe betide you. He was single-minded, laser-focused, deadly as hell. I overheard a major once say that if he had a hundred soldiers like Jamie, the war would be over within a week. But he was reckless, too. Jamie, see, didn't care if he lived or died. He was just this big, seething ball of hate. Nothing mattered to him except taking out as many of the enemy as he could. He died at Sturgis. The Battle of Sturgis was one of the bloodiest of the war, 
rivaled in ferocity and numbers of casualties only by Serenity Valley, and was fought over money, a horde of victory spoils being carried by a freighter, the Sublime, back to the core from the rim. The browncoats were keen to get their hands on this loot in order to help fund their war effort. Just off the planet Sturgis, independent ships attacked the freighter's armed escort at considerable cost to their own forces. Space commandos then boarded the Sublime herself, only to discover that she had been booby-trapped, rigged to explode if a fail-safe mechanism was triggered by the captain. Rather than let the loot fall into independent hands, the captain sacrificed himself and everyone else aboard. Jamie was one of the first on to the sublime, Toby said. I didn't reach it. My spacesuit developed a radiation shielding malfunction, and I had to return to my ship. If not for that, I'd have gone up with Sublime like Jamie and most of the rest of the regiment. That was the end of the 19th Sunbeamers. After that, the regiment was disbanded. I got transferred to an infantry unit, the 31st Raiders. A heck of a squad, said Mal with sincerity. Damn straight we were. Not for nothing were we known as the Angel Makers. Wherever there was trouble, wherever the battle was at its thickest, that was where the 31st were sent. A couple of people in the crowd yelled, Hoorah! in support. Veterans of the same regiment, Mal presumed. There was no question the 31st Raiders had been one of the scrappiest units the brown coats could boast. Their attrition rate was terrible. Life expectancy was around three weeks, a month if you were lucky. The fact that Toby had survived as long as he had was testament to his combat skill and tenacity. The little red-headed guy had been, it seemed, capable of meeting everything the Alliance could throw at him. I first fought alongside Malcolm Reynolds at the Battle of Du Kang, Kobe said. The raiders had taken some heavy hits lately, and we were merged into the whole Balls and Bayonets Brigade along with several other regiments, the 57th Overlanders included. Mal and I eventually got to meet up. That was some kind of reunion. Sure was, Mal said. I was right glad to see you. Friendly face from home. Felt kind of impossible that we'd both come through all we had. And now here we were, fighting alongside each other. Felt like it was meant to be. It did, Toby said almost wistfully. Even after all that happened on Shadow... I still thought of you as my friend. That was before. Before what? Before we were dispatched to Hera. Before we made camp in Serenity Valley. Before the day I dropped by your tent to say hi. The fighting hadn't started yet. We were digging in on our side. Alliance was digging in on the other. Both of us waiting on the attack command. Lull before the storm. I had a spare hour, so I made my way along the lines, found where the overlanders were, looked for you. Someone directed me to your tent, but you weren't there. I decided to wait. That was when I saw your kit bag. It was open. I saw something inside, glinting. I couldn't help it. Had to check. I just got curious. And it was this. Toby delved into his pocket again as he had when producing Ginny's homing beacon. This time he took out a silver crucifix pendant, roughly three inches long and two across, its arms as thick as a baby's finger. Tama de Huntan, Mal exclaimed. That's where that went. All this time, I thought I'd lost it. I ransacked my tent, went through my belongings a hundred times, looked everywhere. He had even accused his corporal of stealing it. Given that she was Zoe Elaine, that had not gone down well. Mal was still amazed she had ever forgiven him. Toby pressed a recessed catch and the front of the crucifix sprang open. Inside lay circuitry. This, Toby said, holding up the device for all to see, is another homing beacon. Its circuitry is the exact double of the circuitry in the beacon on Ginny Adair's body, just in a different configuration. The two units were linked reciprocally, each keyed to the other's unique signature. 
I didn't know that when I first saw it. Some instinct told me there was a connection between this beacon and Ginny's, but I had no way of establishing that for sure. Not then. Not yet. But I took it. Yeah, you thieving rat bastard. You did, Mal snarled. I took it because suddenly things were starting to make sense. Things like how the Alliance knew exactly where the arms cache was at the Adairs, how they'd been able to precision target the cow shed, why Mal had said she was supposed to be safe. Ginny was supposed to be safe because Mal had come to an arrangement with the Alliance, and the Alliance had, surprise, surprise, reneged on it. That just ain't it, Mal cried. Those beacons were just so that Ginny and I would know each other was okay is all. They were a way of us keeping tabs. The plan was she'd wear hers and I'd wear mine, and that way we'd each know the other was okay. Only that never happened because, well, we all know why. But I still kept that crucifix with me as a souvenir to remind me of her. Never once had he actually draped the pendant around his neck, however. Not only had the beacon become redundant and meaningless through the destruction of its counterpart and its counterpart's wearer, but the crucifix itself had started to seem that way too. Mal could pretty much date the loss of whatever religious faith he'd had to the day he lost Ginny Adair. You're reading this all wrong, Toby, he went on. You're making out as if there was this whole terrible conspiracy, and it's all just in your head. Come on, think about it. Why would I have one of those homing beacons too if they were for giving away our location to the Alliance? To keep yourself safe, Toby said. Alliance wouldn't touch you as long as they knew where you were. That second beacon is as incriminating as the first, if not more so. Didn't make much difference at Serenity Valley, for example. I damn near died there. But you didn't before then, Toby declared. That's just it. You, Sergeant Malcolm Reynolds, the Alliance's mole within the brown coat ranks, made it through a couple dozen previous hellstorms unscathed, all because you had that beacon. If you think that, then you... I think, Toby said with a sudden snap of authority, that we have heard quite enough from you, Mal. You can protest till you're blue in the face. The evidence is all here. These two beacons are all the verification anyone needs. You are a traitor, a saboteur, and a collaborator. Right from the very start of the war, you were disloyal to the independent cause. Whether you intended it or not, Ginny Adair became a victim of your treachery. And in return, you got a free pass from the Alliance. I have stated my case. The arguments are more than persuasive. I shall now put it to the good people before us to tell us if they agree or disagree. A show of hands, if you please. Hands shot up in the air. There were growls of, yeah, and yeehaw. One or two abstainers, I see, said Toby. Stu Deacons, David Zuburi. You've yet to be convinced? Well, it doesn't have to be unanimous for the motion to be carried. The yeas far outnumber the nays. Now the crowd swarmed forwards. The bald man who had brandished a noose earlier was once again ready with the length of rope. He and another brown coat slung the loose end over a cross brace of the drilling rig. Meanwhile, Donovan Phillips motioned Mal to walk backwards, using Mal's own liberty hammer as a threat. Stop there. Phillips said when Mal was next to the rig and right under the dangling noose. Do anything dumb like try to resist and I'll put a bullet in you. Won't kill you. Gut shot. It'll hurt like hell and you'll hang anyway. You want that? Don't much want either, Mal said. Everybody, listen up. I'm innocent. There is no way I would have endangered Ginny's life and no way I'd have helped out the Alliance. I am one of you. Always have been. Always will be but he could scarcely make himself heard above the bang of the slavering, eager mob. Their eyes were bright with bloodlust. They had come for a hanging, and by thunder they were going to get a hanging. 
This was the vigilante's primary purpose in life, a fire they had kept stoked in their bellies since the war ended. Someone had to pay for their defeat, and if that someone was another brown coat, why not? There'd been bad apples on both sides, and since they couldn't easily root out the ones on the alliances, they were rooting out the ones on their own. The noose was looped around Mal's neck, the roughness of the rope scratching his skin. Remember Jamie, Mal, Toby said. Remember what Bundy and Crump tried to do to him and would have if you hadn't come along? Same again, only this time it's you who's getting strung up, and you know what? Nobody's coming. There ain't no cavalry, no last-minute reprieve. This is your time, Mal Reynolds. Make your peace if you can, but believe me when I say that hellfire awaits you. You're gonna burn for all eternity with all them other sinners, and you deserve every second of it just for what you did to her. Before Mal could reply, Hans tightened the noose so that the knot was hard against the back of his head and the loop constricted his throat. His airway wasn't quite cut off, but he could only just breathe and certainly could not speak. Mindful of the gun in Donovan Phillips' hand, he didn't squirm or fight. He had no doubt that Phillips would gut-shoot him if provoked. Even if he did get out of the noose somehow, a wound like that would kill him regardless, and slow. He was alive and well right up until the noose strangled him and his legs stopped kicking. Between now and then, there was always a chance, however slim, that he might still escape. These were the mad calculations rushing through his head, how to prolong the little life remaining to him, how to postpone death until the last possible moment. The bald man and his accomplice looked to Toby for final confirmation. Toby raised a hand and slashed it down through the air. Mal felt a tugging on the rope. All at once, he was rising into the air. It was only a few inches. His feet were still in contact with the cavern floor, but just barely. He teetered on his tiptoes, the noose biting into the underside of his jaw. His vision began to blur. He felt vertebrae in his neck creaking. Breaths came in short, gasping sips of air. This wasn't going to be a simple lynching then. It was going to be torture. The vigilantes were going to draw out his death as long as they could. Their faces floated before him like lurid, gloating balloons. Their cries echoed thickly in his ears, seeming to come from underwater. Mal's toe cap scrabbled for purchase on the ground. Already his legs were starting to ache from the effort of keeping him standing. Then, all at once, one foot slipped out from under him. The clench of the noose increased. Mal felt his heartbeat pounding in his head as he struggled to regain his balance. Like some ungainly ballerina, he managed to get back up onto the points of both feet. He remained suspended just above the cavern floor, swaying ever so slightly, twisting clockwise and anticlockwise. He heard some distant pig-like grunting noise and realized it was coming from his own throat. So this was how it was going to be. This was how it ended. The long, wayward, wild voyage of Malcolm Reynolds, from rumbustious kid to combat-hardened warrior to ship's captain. Along the way, there'd been triumphs, tragedies, and all points in between. But only in the recent most portion had he found something like contentment. He owed that, he knew, to his crew, that mixed company of lost souls, misfits, and renegades. They were a family of sorts, the kind you made rather than were born into, the kind that came to surround you through twists of fate and a modicum of choice. They drove him mad sometimes, but he wouldn't have had them any different. While he'd held them together as their captain and guided them safely through the verse, he'd been doing something right, he decided. Something good. That, set in the plus column of his life, surely balanced out everything, and there was a lot of it in the minus column. I've heard tell it can take a man up to six minutes to pass out during a short drop hanging, twenty minutes till he's actually dead. Sheriff Bundy's words came to him unbidden. How many minutes had it been so far? Mal couldn't even begin to tell. It might only have been two or three, and the rope wasn't even strangling him fully yet. 
He felt the strength in his legs ebbing. He didn't know how much longer he could hold out. A haze was descending. Any moment now, he was going to sag in the noose, becoming so much dead weight. He hoped he would lose consciousness swiftly, sooner than Bundy's promised six minutes. There was a gunshot. From a million miles away, Mal felt himself jerk. He didn't know what it meant. It was time to die. 35. Zoe and Jane hurtled along the tunnel following the far-off roar of voices. The anger in that sound was palpable. She prayed she and Jane weren't too late. No mistake, they were getting closer to where they needed to be, but she couldn't help thinking there had been too many delays along the way. A delay in Serenity departing from Eve's down docks, a delay when the feds boarded, a delay in finding a reliable source of intelligence about Mal's whereabouts. That she and Jane were in the right place was no longer in doubt. Zoe, in fact, had been certain of it as soon as Wash set Serenity down at the mine entrance. Three spacecraft had been sitting there, one of them Serenity's own shuttle. Another was a yacht, which must have been Covington's, while the third was a Komodo-class resupply vessel, a war relic with the rust stains and impact pepperings all over the hull to prove it. Parts of it were salvaged from other ships, welded clumsily into place, giving it a patchwork appearance. She guessed it was the vigilante's mode of conveyance and felt an odd tug of admiration. Anyone who traveled the verse in a flying death trap like that deserved respect. Or locking up in a lunatic asylum. She and Jane hastened out of serenity. Jane was more mobile than her and moved faster, loping along in limber fashion. Hampered by her bad leg, she struggled to keep up, but was determined not to lose ground to the big man. She had her mare's leg, Jane had Vera and Boo. They were both anticipating a gun battle and, each in their own way, looking forward to it. Zoe was also carrying something else, a remote detonator switch. While she ran, she pictured Wash and Kaylee in the cargo bay, firing up the forklift. They had their roles to fulfill, and if all went according to plan, there wouldn't be the need for anything except threats, not even gunplay. Yeah, since when did anything ever go according to plan? She and Jane burst out of the tunnel into a cavern, Zoe took stock of the situation at a glance. The crowd, the platform, the drilling rig. Mal suspended from a noose, his eyes bulging, his face magenta. Everyone was too preoccupied to notice her and Jane's arrival. Jane? Yeah? Shoot the rope. Why not cut it? There's a crowd of people between us and Mal. They'll stop us before we even get close. There's no time, no other option. Shoot the rope. That's a hell of a tall order. Fifty yards, dim light, rope shifting about. Just Goram, do it. Jane braced his legs apart and raised Vera to his shoulder, squinting as he peered down the rifle's sights. He switched from heavy caliber cartridge to light for greater accuracy. He took a breath and let it out slowly, forefinger tightening on the trigger. If anyone could make the shot, Zoe said to herself, it was Jane Cobb. Blam! Vera roared. The bullet struck the rope about ten inches above Mal's head. Damn, Jane growled. He had nicked the rope rather than severed it. He readjusted his aim. In the meantime, a couple of dozen faces had turned his and Zoe's way. The rifle report had startled the crowd. Among them, Zoe saw Harlow in his familiar and still fashion disastrous yellow duster. Harlow here? And he was with Hunter Covington. Bastard. He'd lied to her through his teeth. All along, he'd known exactly who Covington was. Her hand gripped her mare's leg hard. There was going to be a reckoning between him and her. Jane was lining up a second shot. Mal looked as though he was just about ready to expire. He was going limp. If Jane didn't cut the rope this time, Mal was dead. Don't let me down, girl, Jane muttered to his gun. Vera roared again. The rope snapped and Mal collapsed to the ground. A gaunt little man up on the platform yelled, No! The crowd were also aghast, and now, as one, they surged towards Zoe and Jane, the interlopers who had deprived them of their fun. Zoe held the remote detonator switch aloft. 
while Jane swiveled Vera to and fro in front of the brown coats menacingly. Everybody, she said. Stop. Know what this is in my hand? Remote detonator. Know what it's connected up to? A crate of HTX-20, a crate that has been offloaded from my ship into the entrance to this mine. It's sitting there right now, and all I have to do is let go of this here button and boom. Cave in. We performed a ground radar survey as we came in, mapping the mine layout. There's only one way in or out, and that's through that tunnel. The HTX-20 brings the roof down, and we're all stuck here from now till doomsday. I am not kidding. The brown coat vigilantes paused, studying her face. To them, she really didn't look as though she was kidding. Shoot her, the man on the platform cried. One of you, shoot the bitch. Guns were drawn. Yeah, about that, Zoe said unflappably. If you look closely, you'll see it's a dead man switch. I told you already, all I have to do is let go of the button. Anybody shoots me, guess what? I'll be letting go for damn sure. She will, Jane said. And in case you were wondering, this here is a Callahan full bore auto lock. A heavy caliber round from this bad boy hits you anywhere, even if it misses vital organs. The shock of the impact will still kill you. So you gotta ask yourself one question. Am I gonna be stupid enough to take the risk? Now, said Zoe, somebody, I don't much care who, is going to walk over to my friend there and loosen that rope off of him. She waited for a volunteer. Someone's got to do it, she said. Mood I'm in right now? I'm more than happy just to blow that high explosive and have done with it. You people call yourselves brown coats? This isn't how brown coats act. I was one, and I'm ashamed even to be around you. Trapping you all in this mine? That'd be worthwhile even if I'm stuck along with you. A man raised a hand. I'll do it, Zoe frowned. Deacons? That you? Sure is, Ms. Elaine. Been a while. You're with these people? I'd have thought better of you. To be honest, Corp, I'd have thought better of myself. I'll free him. Don't you do it, Stuart Deacons, the man on the platform yelled. Don't you dare. Oh, hush your squawking, Toby Finn, Deacon said. We've heard enough from you. If Zoe Elaine thinks Mal Reynolds is worth rescuing and worth putting her own ass on the line for what's more, then that settles it as far as I'm concerned. Mal ain't guilty of what you're accusing him of. The man deserves to go free. Toby Finn yanked a gun from his holster. Not another step, Deacons, I'm telling you. Jane swung Vera so that the gaunt little guy, evidently the ringleader of the vigilantes, was lined up in the reticle of his gun sight. Want I should take him out, Zoe? Not if you don't have to, Zoe replied. But he so much as twitches his trigger finger. Gotcha. Stuart Deacon's shoulder barged his way through the sullen crowd and knelt beside Mal. Mal lay so still that Zoe thought he must be dead. After all this, had everything been in vain? She choked back the fear. Mal was okay. Surely he was okay. Deacons untied the noose, then rolled Mal over onto his back. Someone else Zoe recognized, David Zuburi, joined him. Together, the two men conferred, then Deacons began to administer CPR to Mal, alternately pumping his chest and blowing into his mouth. Zoe watched, her grip on the detonator switch growing slick. 36. Outside the mine entrance, Wash drove the forklift back toward Serenity. He had just deposited, very carefully, a single crate of HTX-20, roughly ten yards inside. Kaylee was standing on the cargo bay ramp. She looked jumpy, on edge, more so than previously. Why the face? Wash asked as he braked to a halt. We need to offload the other four crates. What? Kaylee held up a scanner. Just taking some fresh readings. The explosives are heating up faster than ever. They're going critical, and there ain't nothing I can think of to do to retard or reverse the process. I'd say we have maybe ten, fifteen minutes before they blow. Effet de pillon, you've got to be kidding me. Wish I were. Badger sure handed us a Zhengxi Dugoshi Dui. Wouldn't surprise me if he did it on purpose. 
What for, to piss us off? If so, mission accomplished, I'm pissed off. But I'm not sure even Badger would be that much of a crap heel, not when there's money involved. Okay, now, let's see what our options are. Wash surveyed the area. The mine entrance had been dug into a mountainside. Serenity and the other three ships were positioned on the only level space available, a broad, windswept ledge with a sheer crag towering above and a steep-sided base descending to a barren plain below. There wasn't room to deposit the crates on the ledge a safe distance away. If they went off there, all four ships would be damaged, probably destroyed, and everyone would be stranded on Hades. But if he tipped them over the edge, chances were they would explode when they hit the bottom. HTX-20 did not like nasty surprises, after all. That, in turn, might trigger a rock slide, and then there'd be a tangled mess of rubble and no longer space-worthy ship at the foot of the mountain. No alternative, he said. The other four crates have to go inside the mine entrance alongside the fifth. That's insane. It's that or we lose Serenity, the shuttle, the yacht, and that Komodo heap of junk. We only put the one crate there in the first place in case somebody calls Zoe's bluff and goes to check that she can seal them inside if she wants to, like she's threatening, Kaylee said. It's all a ruse, right? That's the plan. She's got the detonator switch only as a prop. In fact, thinking about it, we should get that crate out of the mine right now in case it blows up of its own accord. We shouldn't be putting another four of the Goran things in there. If we don't, we all die, said Wash. If we do, there's a chance Zoe and Jane can still get back out, ideally with Mal before all the crates go up. I don't like it any more than you do, Kaylee, but I don't see any other option. Kaylee gnawed her lower lip, then slowly, reluctantly nodded. They won't have long. They don't hurry. They're dead. And so are we, said Wash, gunning the forklift's motor. 37. Everything was dark where Mal was, and warm, and weirdly cozy, a nice place. He wanted to stay there. Then there was a stab of pain. Light flooded in. He heaved for a breath. There were a man's lips on his. Wait, 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 Mal yelped, sitting bolt upright. Stu, what the hell, partner? Stuart Deacon sat back on his haunches. You're back, Mal. Thank God. Thought for a moment there we'd lost you. Mal's throat felt as though it was lined with sandpaper. To speak, even just to breathe, hurt. His head seemed to be attached to the rest of him by a slender thread. Yet he was alive. Sweet Mary, mother of Jesus, he was alive. He blinked around. There was David Zuburi. There was Hunter Covington. There was Yellow Duster. There were all the brown coats looking somewhat disgruntled. No sign of Toby Finn, though. And Zoe, Jane, they were there too? Sir, Zoe said across the cavern, glad to have you back. Me too, what kept you guys? Oh, you know, this and that. Stu, you just resuscitate me? I did? That would explain the kissing, leastwise I hope it does. I owed you one for you saving my ass at New Casimir, Deacon said. That was the least I could do. Next time, maybe you can show your gratitude in a less intimate manner. Deacon smiled. Sure will. Weren't no picnic for me either. You ain't shaved lately and you're kind of bristly. Snake, someone yelled. Defector! Goram Judas! Next thing Mal knew, Donovan Phillips was rushing towards them. He had Mal's liberty hammer out, leveled it at Stuart Deacon's, and fired. The top of Deacon's head vanished in a crimson mist. Deacon slumped sideways, nothing on his face but a look of utter incomprehension. Mal moved faster than a man just brought back from the brink of death might reasonably be expected to. He sprang at Phillips, grabbing his gun hand. The pair of them grappled, each trying to gain mastery of the weapon. Phillips was at that moment the stronger of the two, he hadn't just been hanged. Mal, however, had blinding, all-consuming fury on his side. Stuart Deacons had proved himself to be a decent human being after all, and this scum-sucking son of a bitch had shot him from behind like the coward he was. All at once, the liberty hammer was in Mal's hand. He didn't hesitate. Phillips's scar-ridden face collapsed into terror. 
He held up his hands in surrender, but Mal was not in a merciful mood. He shot point blank at the heart, and Donovan Phillips was dead before he hit the ground. After that, consternation reigned. The brown coat vigilantes bellowed in shock and disapproval. They seemed to have forgotten all about Zoe and the detonator, until she reminded them by firing her mare's leg twice at the ceiling. That brought a measure of calm to the proceedings. Just a little reminder there, she said. Now you are going to let the three of us leave. You are not going to get in our way. To reiterate, I am quite prepared to let go of this switch at any time. Don't anyone give me a reason to. Sir? Mal was on his feet and moving away from the drilling rig, but not towards Zoe and Jane. Toby Finn was gone. He had lit out while Mal was unconscious. There was a second tunnel leading out from the cavern, not towards the entrance, but in the opposite direction, presumably deeper underground. Toby could only have disappeared down there. Mal was determined to catch up to him. He and Toby needed to have words. Sir, Zoe hollered behind him, but Mal paid her no heed. He headed off down the tunnel, stumbling on its rugged, uneven rock floor. Toby, he called out. Toby, I just want to talk. Illumination from the cavern diminished the further he ventured in. Soon he was walking more or less blind, groping his way with one hand held out in front of him, the liberty hammer in his other hand. Toby, hey, pal, stop running. We can sort things out. We were two of the four amigos once. Don't see why we can't be that way again. The gun Mal was carrying somewhat gave the lie to what he was saying. Truth was, he would just as happily shoot Toby dead as reconcile with him. Much depended on how Toby acted now. If he showed even the tiniest amount of remorse or contrition, Mal might, just might, mind, be able to find it in his heart to forgive him. Come on, old buddy, why don't you... If his brain hadn't still been fogged from the near hanging, he might have seen the blow coming. Might have been able to duck out of the way. As it was, something came out of nowhere and slammed into his face, knocking him flat. The liberty hammer flew from his grasp, skidding across the tunnel floor. His head reeled. He'd been slugged with the butt of a pistol. He gasped for air. No, Mal, said Toby, a black silhouette in the dimness. We can't be friends again. There can't be any four amigos again because you ruined it. A gun barrel loomed in Mal's vision. His own gun lay several yards away, well out of easy reach. By killing Jenny, Mal said hoarsely. But it wasn't anything to do with me. You must know that. Those homing beacons were for me and her alone. Yes, and I know why. Toby was all but screaming. I know about you and Ginny. I knew just what you were doing behind my back. Mal fumbled for words. But, what, you knew? But why didn't you say anything at the time? How could I, Mal? It was almost over between Ginny and me. I could feel it, but I didn't want it to end. Damn it, I was going to marry that woman. I had it all planned out, but I was losing her. And I began to notice little things, little clues that suggested maybe her heart belonged to someone else. You. Like, she would pause whenever your name came up in conversation. Sometimes she would avoid talking about you, steering around the subject like it was a boulder in the road. Before then, her face used to light up when you were mentioned, and suddenly it started darkening instead. I wasn't sure about it. I couldn't be certain she was cheating on me with you, but then why wouldn't she be? You were the dashing Mal Reynolds in me. I was just lowly little Toby Finn, not fit to tie the bootlaces of a girl like Ginny Adair. I'd lucked into becoming her boyfriend, but it was clear you and she were a better fit. Toby, I'm sorry, Mal said. Truly, I am. You can spare me the apologies. They don't mean squat. Maybe you could have said something at the time. Maybe we could have figured it out. I didn't know for certain, Toby said, and I was scared to raise the topic in case I was wrong. It wasn't until Ginny died and I saw how you were about that, how cut up, that I realized I'd been right. Even then, I'd have forgiven you, in time. But the war came and we went our separate ways until Hera, until that day I went to your tent and found the second beacon. 
that's when everything clicked into place. All of this, Mal said, piecing things together. Kidnapping me, trying me, hanging me. This isn't about me betraying the independent cause. It never was. You know I didn't. That stuff about the beacons, that was just for the brown coats, A smokescreen. This is all about revenge, isn't it? Toby seemed as though he was going to deny it, then shook his head ruefully. Yeah. Not that I don't believe in what me and these other brown coats have been doing, rounding up true traitors and bringing them to justice. It's been a necessary evil. But you and me, Mal? This one's personal. I've been waiting for this a long time. Only now did the stars align and everything come together. You got the rest of them to go along with it, even though you know the case against me was as flimsy as rice paper. Wasn't difficult. They're disgruntled, easily led. They've been at this so long, they've begun to lose sight of why. They just love the blaming and the accusing and the executing. Makes them feel good about themselves, and you've seen them. Do those look to you like people who've many reasons to feel good about themselves? Some of them needed more talking round than others, but we got there in the end. We paid Hunter Covington just about every piece of platinum we could scrape together in order to get a lead on you. Seemed a fair price. I even plundered my own savings, such as they were. Don't have a single coin left to my name. Yeah, but wasn't what you were doing dangerous to you? Mightn't it have backfired if the others had realized this thing was just a whole dog and pony show? If so, what do I care? Toby said with a hapless shrug. My time's running out anyway. Mal's eyesight was adjusting to the gloom. Toby's face looked pallid and haggard, a wreck of its old self. You ain't well, are you? Mal said. You're seriously sick. What is it? Damp lung? Wilson's palsy? Cancer. The terminal kind. All over. The whole meal. Soup to nuts. Toby. Got it, cause of my spacesuit's shielding failing, it's Sturgis, most likely. Docs reckon I must have received a dose of cosmic radiation. Not enough to fry me on the spot, but enough to send a few internal organs gradually haywire. The war's finally catching up with me after all these years. I'm a dead man walking, but at least I finally got to see you paying the penalty for what you did to me. Toby, maybe there's a cure, Mal said. I have a doctor on board my ship, a really good one. He can try and fix you. He can't, Mal. Nobody can. You know what, though? I thought I'd be happier to see you on the end of a rope. I really did. But somehow it just made me sad. Toby's voice was thick, husky. He sounded close to crying. Sad that it's come to this, and sad for all that we lost. Not just Jamie and Ginny, not the millions of men and women the war killed. The innocence. The fun we used to have on Shadow. Fooling around, getting chased by Bundy. They were good times, weren't they, Mal? The best, Toby. The best. Now Toby really was crying, deep sobs racking his body. Oh, God, Mal, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I shouldn't have, I should never. Toby's gun had begun to droop in his grasp. Mal cast a quick sidelong glance towards his own gun. If he could just keep this conversation going a few seconds longer, keep Toby distracted and off beam, he might be able to make a bid for the Liberty Hammer. He tensed, ready to bat Toby's gun aside and lunge for his own weapon. It's okay, Toby. We're good. Come on, help me up and let's go see if we can't. A shot rang out. Toby's body jolted. He fell against the tunnel wall, then slid down to the floor. Mal, ears ringing from the detonation, turned to see Jane standing some twenty feet away. Vera was in his hands, smoke coiling up from her muzzle. Got him. Jane said with cold satisfaction. You okay, Mal? Mal looked back at Toby Finn, now just an inert heap, 
chin on sternum, blood on his breastbone, glistening in the faint light. In a way, he was glad Jane had shot Toby. Even after everything, he mightn't have been able to do it himself. In fact, he reckoned Jane had done Toby a favor. Toby had been dying anyway. Jane had only hastened what was inevitable, ending his life quickly, unexpectedly, rather than leaving him to be eaten away an inch at a time by the slow horror of cancer. Come on, Jane said. We gotta go. Don't know how much longer Zoe's gonna be able to keep the vigilantes at bay with that detonator switch, Con. They're getting all kinds of antsy. Con? Jane brought Mal up to speed on the plan involving the crate and the detonator. Not bad, Mal said. Kind of sneakiness I might have come up with. Wearily, he got to his feet and retrieved his gun. He couldn't remember when he had ever felt quite so tired, or so old. Jane turned back down the tunnel, and Mal staggered after. 38 Back in the cavern, Zoe was indeed finding it increasingly hard to keep the brown coats restrained. Sonia Zuburi was giving her all manner of grief, calling her names and making feints towards her, trying to grab the detonator switch. Even back during the war, there had never been much love lost between Zoe and Sonia. She'd been a good soldier, but Zoe, even on her worst day, was ten times better. And whereas Zoe had been fast-tracked to corporal, Sonia had remained a humble private to the bitter end. That had been a source of great anguish and frustration to Sonia, and she had tried to undermine Zoe every chance she got. You won't do it, bitch, Sonia goaded. You don't have the balls. At least I don't keep my husbands in a purse, Zoe retorted. Someone sniggered, and Sonia shot them a filthy look. David Zuburi himself seemed unamused, but appeared to acknowledge that there was some truth in Zoe's taunt. Out of the corner of her eye, Zoe saw Hunter Covington and Harlow sneaking towards the exit tunnel. She would have to deal with them later. Right now, what mattered was the angry brown coats. Where the hell was Jane? She had sent him off in pursuit of Mal. He surely should have found him by now. There was a gunshot from the tunnel Jane had followed Mal into. Zoe recognized the deep, bassy boom of Vera. Moments later, Jane emerged from the tunnel with Mal in tow. The already irate brown coats became more irate still. Where's Toby Finn? Someone demanded to know. What have you done with him? Zoe could tell the situation was about to spiral into chaos. Not even the threat of blowing up the mine entrance was going to keep a lid on it much longer. She began backing towards the tunnel, the barrel of her mare's leg tracking this way and that, pausing at random brown coats and curbing their aggression, if only temporarily. I will shoot, Zoe warned, backing towards the exit. I don't want to, but I will if I have to, and anyone who knows me knows I am not the type to make idle threats. Nonetheless, the crowd kept edging closer, inciting one another forwards. An array of guns bristled around Zoe. Let's rush her, Sonia said. Somebody grabs her hand, clamps it tight around that switch, there'll be nothing she can do. Then Jane and Mal were at Zoe's side. That gave her a little more leverage, and the brown coats knew it. They weren't up against a lone gunwoman anymore, but a trio. We're out of here, Jane said to the crowd, and I'd advise anyone who's thinking about getting in our way to not to. Get in our way, that is. Or even think about it. As they retreated towards the entrance, Zoe kept an eye out for Covington and Harlow, who might be lying in wait somewhere along the tunnel. In her judgment, however, the two men wouldn't be hanging around. Instead, they'd be making for Covington's yacht and hightailing it off Hades as fast as they could. Neither was any slouch when it came to self-preservation, she thought, and they must have realized that if it came to a shootout between the brown coats and Zoe, Jane, and Mal, there was a good chance of getting caught in the crossfire. She was mistaken about that and nearly got a bullet through the head for her pains. Where the tunnel jinked round a corner, Harlow was lurking. If Zoe hadn't caught a glimpse of the tail of his absurd yellow duster, she might not have been able to dodge in time. Her mare's leg thundered a repost, blasting away a section of rock just inches from Harlow's hiding place. Mr. Covington told me to delay you people, Harlow called out. Offered me damn good money for it, too, so that's what I'm gonna do. 
Zoe looked at Jane, put a finger to her lips, and gestured at him to pass Boo over to her. Jane duly unholstered the wheel gun, giving her a mildly quizzical frown. Zoe responded with a trust me look. For what she had in mind, her mare's leg wouldn't do. She needed a solid round, not buckshot. Harlow, she said, softly cocking Boo's hammer. Listen, let us pass, and we won't kill you. Nah, figure I'll just pin you three down where you are. Those brown coats are coming, I can hear them. They're following you up the tunnel. If I keep you there till they catch up, you'll have plenty on your plate, and Mr. Covington and me, we can just mosey on home at our leisure. I wish you'd said you knew all along who Covington was and what this was all about. Zoe began inching towards him, covering the sound of her advance by talking. Would have made a difference. Fooled you, huh, hop along? And I led you a merry dance through Eve's down as well, didn't I? After we parted company, I knew you'd follow me, so I gave you the runaround. I thought winding up at Badger's was a stroke of genius. Figure he'd tangle you up if nothing else did. Closer, she crept, ever closer, the wheel gun at the ready. Yeah, you're a smart operator, all right, Harlow. She studied the formation of the tunnel wall. The angles were just about right. It all depended on how good her eye was. A real cool customer. You'd have to be to pull off that ten-gallon hat and puke-yellow duster combo. Ah, uh, don't be like that. I thought we'd reached a kind of understanding, you and me. Oh, we have, Zoe said, lining up her shot. I understand that you're a gas-bag idiot who loves the sound of his own voice. And me? I'm the one who's about to deflate you. Now what in the hell do you mean by... Zoe fired. The round ricocheted once, twice, and then Harlow gave a kind of, uh, sound and toppled forward into view, thudding to the tunnel floor. Uh, he groaned, blood leaking from the corner of his mouth. That was some nice shooting, Hopalong. Damn nice. And to think, you and me, we could have had something special. His eyes rolled white, his mouth slackened, his eyelids closed, and he was gone. Zoe tossed Boo back to Jane, who caught and holstered the wheel gun in a single smooth action. From behind, the clamor of the approaching browncoats grew louder. Come on, she said to Mal and Jane. Nearing the tunnel entrance, the three Serenity crew members were greeted by Wash. He was just depositing the last of the five crates inside the tunnel. Wash? What the hell's this? said Zoe. We only needed one crate, not the whole Gorem lot. Yeah, well, uh, about that, said Wash. Turns out we're going to have to dump all of them here. Our entire cargo? said Mal. You better have a good reason. Great to see you too, Captain. Glad you're well. Never mind that. Get these damn crates back on my ship. Uh, no can do. Kaylee says the HTX-20 is about to go off, and when that happens, it's best we're not around. She sure about that? I don't think she's just saying it for comedic effect. Goram it, Mal said. We never catch a break, do we? From outside came a high-pitched whine of a ship's engine powering up, resounding down the tunnel. Oh yeah, that'll be Covington's yacht, Wash said. He ran past me a couple of minutes ago. Didn't even stop to say hi. Guess he was in too much of a hurry. Pity, though. Why? I had Kaylee sneak aboard his ship. She's disabled it. Listen to that. The engine noise stuttered, then became a horrendous metallic gurgle. Zoe pictured the yacht shuddering from stem to stern like a vomiting cat. Covington's going nowhere in a hurry. Kaylee's detached his pulse alternator and left it hanging off by its wires. It's an easy fix, assuming he figures out that's what the problem is. Jane and Mal hurried onward to the entrance. Zoe clambered onto the side of the forklift next to her husband. My leg's playing merry hell, she said. Mind giving a girl a lift? Don't normally pick up hitchhikers, but for you, pretty lady, I'll make an exception. Wash deftly spun the vehicle around on its axis and drove it out into daylight. Just as they neared Serenity, shots crackled from the tunnel entrance. Rounds wanged and whined off the forklift's bodywork. Wash ducked and swore while Zoe leaned around and returned fire, her mare's leg booming. Mal and Jane from the cargo bay ramp added their own salvos to hers. 
The vigilantes were positioned just inside the tunnel mouth, some distance past the five crates of explosive. It seemed they were keen that the people who had disrupted their lynching should not get away scot-free. Sonia Zaburi was the one egging them on. We can still take them down, she yelled. Her husband, David, at her side, looked less convinced. Hold your fire, Zoe called out to them. All of you, listen. She was shouting at the top of her voice, but above the sound of gunfire, she was inaudible to the browncoats. Still, she persevered. Those crates are about to blow, and when they do, they'll bring this entire mountain down around our heads. The vigilantes carried on with their broadside. Only David Zuburi seemed to have heard what Zoe had said. He was gesticulating and calling for a ceasefire, but he might as well have been dancing a jig for all the difference it made. Serenity's shuttle abruptly burst into life. Zoe glimpsed Kaylee at the controls. Kaylee offered her a brief wave before goosing the engines to the very limits of their tolerance and launching. Wash scooted the forklift up the cargo bay ramp and was off and running for the bridge before the vehicle had even come to a full stop. What about Covington? Zoe asked Mal. We can't just leave him there, can we? Don't see why not. Guy's a bond holder and an all-around shark. He's got a chance to get away if he can mend what Kaylee did to his boat. If he can't, that's his tough datiao. Serenity began rumbling around them. Over the intercom, Wash said, Know those wonderfully genteel laid-back takeoffs I'm so famous for? This ain't gonna be one of them. Hang on tight, everyone. The ship lurched skyward with enough force to throw Mal, Jane, and Zoe off kilter. Zoe felt the downward press of G-force, like a giant invisible hand trying to squash her flat, and bent her knees to absorb it as best she could. Serenity seemed to be fighting for every inch of altitude she gained. Zoe had no idea when the HTX-20 was going to explode, but she knew she didn't want to be anywhere near when it happened. Then it came. A percussive blast like every thunderclap there had ever been all rolled into one. It was followed by the tumult of the overpressure wave seizing Serenity and shaking the ship about like an infant with a toy rattle. Zoe, Mal, and Jane grabbed whatever they could for support. There was a series of sickening swoops and sores, pitches and yaws like riding the worst roller coaster ever. In her mind's eye, Zoe saw a wash up on the bridge battling to maintain control of the spacecraft and keep her on an even keel. No one could fly like Hoban Washburn. It was one of the articles of faith in Zoe's life. If anybody could get them through this safely, it was him. Sometime later, seconds of juddering upheaval that felt like hours, Serenity righted and leveled out. Zoe staggered over to the nearest rearward viewing port. Below, a mountain was dying. Its slopes were sinking inward on themselves, sending up a mighty pillar of dust and debris like smoke from the cauldron of a volcano. Huge chunks of rock had sheared away and were slithering down towards the plain some quarter mile below. Amidst the tumbling avalanche, she glimpsed Covington's yacht and the vigilante's Komodo-class vessel. Both were rolling end over end, losing sections of hull plate and chunks of airframe along the way. They crashed to the bottom and were engulfed by rubble. Of the brown coats themselves, there was no sign, but then Zoe wasn't expecting any. They would have been vaporized when the HTX-20 went up. She wished she felt sorrier for them than she did. Mal appeared beside her and looked on as the mountain continued to implode, shelving down into itself, becoming a crater. Gradually, the turmoil receded into the distance as Serenity gained more height. Care to tell me what this was all about, sir? She asked as the pale blue of Hades' atmosphere started shading into the inky blue of low-orbit space. Long story, Zoe, Mal said forlornly. Long story from long, long ago. Another time, maybe. Right now, my throat's as parched as a sidewinder's belly, and I believe there may be a bottle of sorghum wine somewhere in the galley. Care to join me? You have some bide you, Jane said. That rot gut? I'm in. If it's not considered insubordination, sir, Zoe said, I would rather go up to the bridge and smooch with my husband. I reckon he's earned it. Know what? said Mal, with just a hint of the old familiar twinkle returning to his eyes. I reckon he has in all. So we're all back on one boat again, the nine of us. 
Serenity has both her shuttles nestled on her wings. The chick's back with Mama Bird, and we're heading off once more into the black to see what we can find work-wise. The usual deal, whatever's going, if it pays, we'll take it. Sorry state of affairs, but that's how it is. Ain't a kind or a just verse, and nobody's owed a living. Simon says my neck's healing nicely. Rope burns won't even leave a scar, thanks to his doctrine. Talking still hurts some, but on this boat, with Wash and Kaylee to name but two, it ain't as if there's a scarcity of chitter-chatter. Badger was rightly mad about his explosives. I pointed out that at least they'd blown up somewhere off my ship, because if they'd destroyed Serenity and I hadn't been on board, right now I'd be introducing him to the business end of a gun, shooting off little bits of him one after another. And if I had been on board, my ghost would be haunting him till the day he died. Guess he feels I owe him one. Guess I feel we're quits. Besides, Badger will get over it. He's what you call the resilient type. Too plain opportunistic or optimistic or whatever to burn a bridge permanently. Elmira Adema is a free woman now. Book's pal Mika Wong didn't even need to pay off her debt, what with Hunter Covington being buried under a mountain and no longer in a fit state to collect and all, so he was pleased about that. I met Elmira for all of five minutes, after we'd rendezvoused on Persephone with Book, Inara, and the Tams. Even in that brief span of time, she made an impression. Despite all she'd been through as a bondswoman and a confidential informer, all that suffering and peril, she seemed as if she was coping and would be able to move on with her life. Like Badger, resilient. Also, unlike Badger, not a pain in the ass. And now that we're flying free, I've got time to think. About the past. About lost loves, damaged friendships, and heart-wrenching regrets. I won't ever be free of Jamie and Toby, I reckon. Wasn't free of Ginny before. But it does seem as though some things that needed fixing have been fixed, and some loose ends squared away. Maybe if Ginny and me had been honest with Toby from the start, none of this would have happened. It was Ginny's call, though, and I went along with it because I respected her decision and I loved her. You can't change the past, and you can't do aught but rue the way you sometimes acted back when you were young and stupid and thought you were immortal. Doesn't prevent you from wishing you could. I've been thinking about stopping by Shadow, although not sure I'm up for that. I hear there's plants pushing up through the cinders now around the spot where the Adair's cowshed stood. I might like to see that for myself. But then I mightn't want to reopen those old wounds either. Might also pay a call on Sheriff Bundy, Governor Bundy, whatever his title is these days, assuming the overweight bastard's still alive and some clogged artery of his hasn't popped. Maybe he and I can have words, get to the bottom of what happened. And if he did what I think he did, I'll teach him the error of his ways. Maybe some other time. For now, we'll do what we do. Find a job. Keep flying. Captain Malcolm Reynolds This concludes the reading of Firefly, Big Damn Hero by James Lovegrove. Original story concept by Nancy Holder. Trademark and copyright 2018 by 20th Century Fox Film Corporation. All rights reserved. This book was read by James Anderson Foster. This unabridged recording was produced in 2019. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Publishing. If you would like to obtain a monthly update telling you about new releases, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. For a complete listing of our titles, visit our website at www.downpour.com. Thank you. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.